Good morning and happy hump day to you who celebrate out there. It's 9 a.m. here in New York City. I'm Brad Smith alongside Diane King Hall. This is Yahoo Finance Live, and here is what we're watching this morning. Private employers added 103,000 jobs in November, according to ADP, a sharp slowdown from the month prior and a sign of continual cooling in the once resilient labor market. Meantime, big banks head to Washington. J.P. Morgan Chase's Jamie Dimon and Citigroup's Jane Frazier are among the execs set to appear in front of lawmakers today with some choice words on new regulations for the sector. Plus, how long can you go? How low can you go, rather? Amazon is making it cheaper for merchants to sell low-cost clothing on its site. It's a signal that the e-commerce platform is looking to compete with fast fashion giants like Shein and Timu. I haven't heard of that one. <laughs> Shein, yeah. once a dark horse in the online retail space, grew to prominence in 2022, then valued at $100 billion. It became the world's largest fashion retail Taylor, thanks to haul videos on TikTok and Instagram Reels. Now with Sheehan reportedly eyeing an IPO in 2024, that would make it one of the largest U.S. listings ever. Amazon might be feeling the pressure. The e-commerce giant is slashing its fees for merchants who sell clothing for under $20. We have our very own Brooke De Palma with us. Uh, Brooke, so I looked at this blog post where they talked about what's coming down the pike. What are the changes that stood out to you that Amazon's making? Yeah, well, in that blog post, no mention of Shein, no mention of Timu. They are straying away from the competition, saying that they are singularly focused on their own business here. They announced that they're going to reduce seller fees on clothing products priced below $15 to 5%. Now, for fees on clothing products priced from 15 to to $20, that seller's fee will drop to 10%. Now, commissions on both these categories previously had been 17%. For uh, clothing that's higher priced, that will remain unchanged. For any clothing above $20, that will remain unchanged. Now, these changes will go into effect January 15, 2024, so it won't happen until next year. But of course, all eyes on that potential Shein IPO. They did reportedly file confidentially to go public here in the U.S. And of course, they do face ongoing competition. We are seeing other competitors like Timu, mm -hmm. like TikTok Shop really come into the foreplay, especially engaging Gen Z, which all retail has a close watch on now. And of course, Amazon has really captivated the U.S e-commerce market now potential competition from Shein perhaps scaring them spooking them a bit yeah yeah certainly you you think about what we've heard recently with regard to the potential for Shein to become a public company here in the U.S. I mean it is a little bit of an uphill battle when you think about the regulatory climate mm -hmm. for Shein <clears throat> regulators have a problem with Shein's uh, labor practices particularly when it comes to their relationship with China and Shein itself has been distancing itself from China right. so Amazon also trying to get in front of that public debut and make it more attractive certainly for merchants on its platform. And to your point, there, there weren't any other changes that, to me, were beneficial. Uh, but this is a big one, especially when you think about the cost that merchants have to pay, the fees that merchants mm -hmm. have to pay, and Amazon trying to hold on to more of the pie when it comes to these cheaper products. And then, you know, we haven't even talked about, like, you know, as much about Timu, which has taken some of Shein's market yeah. share. And these low price item is really what is tapping into consumers' wands nowadays. Everyone's looking for value. Everybody wants to get the best bang for their buck, and they are willing to compromise for a cheaper, perhaps yep. lower quality item in order to get what they want in a pinch. And Amazon right now, they did mention in that blog post that they remain an average of 70% less expensive than two-day shipping methods offered by other third-party logistic providers. Of course, we're seeing others get into this marketplace space. We saw Walmart really step up their e-commerce mm -hmm. game in recent years. Mm -hmm. Target doing the same, perhaps inviting third-party sellers as well. And so this is really an ongoing game here that so many retailers are really trying to tap into online e-commerce isn't going anywhere and consumers looking for value isn't going no. anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, and sure, inflation has come down. Yeah. We've talked about this numerous times, yeah. Brad. You know. We have to. Yes! <laughs> I mean, we also got to talk about the fact that Amazon has sunsetted about 27 out of 30 of their in-house brands. And at a time where consumers are looking for any type of trade down away from some of the more expensive fashion out there, fast fashion mm -hmm. has stood in the gap because it's easy for a lot of these companies to just pump out or yeah. have mm -hmm. specific collaborations that they're able to then kind of hype up and then bring customers into the fray on some of the other items, the essential items that they can sell for the low low. But at the end of the day, for Amazon, low, low. even as they had kind of rolled back some of those brands like Larkin Row and a yeah, bevy of other dozens yeah. of names that they had produced over the years, this year, uh, really rolling that back 
it goes to show at a time right now where consumers are looking for that trade down option that they need to engage with some of those other fast fashion players that are able to right. sell in as third party merchants on their site too. Yeah, and many of these companies are not going to say that they're fast fashion. They're no, really, but of course, they are. But they really are trying to get ahead of the trends. They're yeah. saying that they're producing a lower amount of inventory, especially a year ago when that was such an issue, and that they're pushing out really engaging customers with what they want. But of course, we do see an inventory mm -hmm. woe continue to, to be an issue right. within the industry at large, but really capitalizing on that search engine optimization, looking for what retailers want, perhaps that puffy vest that's trending right now. That's looking what's to trending? Get on. Oh, yeah. The puffy, puffy short vest. Have that's you not back? seen this? Yeah. That is very much so back. So much stuff is back. I mean, we're not surprised <laughs> when it comes to fashion, especially with fast fashion, that they'll bring something, you know, back and let's see who can dominate their weather. Who can capitalize on exactly, it as well. Exactly. Whether it's Shein, Amazon, or Timu. We'll see, mm -hmm. Brooke. All right, Brooke, thanks so much for helping us break this down. We're going to be tracking all this very closely as we move on throughout the rest of the session. Let's also start the morning with some latest labor data points that have just dropped. ADP employment, that coming out this morning. Private employers, they added 103,000 jobs in November, according to data from ADP. The robust labor market of 2023 finally cooling as we head into the winter, a sign that the Fed's efforts to slow the economy are taking hold. But will that slowdown come at the cost of consumer spending? Here to answer that question for us, we've got Josh Schaefer joining us here at the table. Josh, you've had some time to really dig into these numbers this morning. Yeah, Brad, I mean, at a high level, it's the kind of ADP report you wanted to see based on what we saw from Jolt's data yesterday. Of course, that Jolt's data from October, the ADP data from November. But we're looking for evidence of a soft landing, right? Yeah. Some signs of labor market cooling, maybe wages coming down, but wages still being higher than inflation. This checks all of those boxes. So in theory, it's sort of, okay, on to the next one yeah. when you think about it that way. One thing, though, that I think is interesting to highlight here, and ADP does a great job of this because of their data with payrolls, is the difference between job changers and job stayers and how much money they're making. The gap is really closing. Remember in the pandemic, there was a time where you might have been talking to a friend at a bar and they're telling you they're leaving their job and they're going and getting a 16%, 17% raise. Yeah. That's down to 8% now. And for a that's job still stay, good, though. For, it, it's good, but for job stayers, it's 5.6%. So that's the lowest margin we've had between someone that leaves their job and someone that stays at their job, their annual increase. That's the lowest margin we've seen in three years. So sort of normalizing in some way, and it shows that the labor market is normalizing because people don't just want to quit, right? We've seen that in the quits right. rate. Mm -hmm. right. The quits rate st stayed flat now for four straight months in that Jolts data. That's because people are feeling a little bit less confident that, okay, if I quit my job, there's three different jobs that want to go hire me. That's not really the narrative right now in the labor market, and I think it was a year ago. And it will be interesting to see if there is any correlation to the jobs report on Friday. Mm -hmm. I mean, the expectation, obviously, is for less than 200,000 jobs, but not at this, this number that we're seeing from ADP. And over the years, the correlation, they haven't been as correlated as they mm -hmm. used to be, although I think the last report was more... Uh, similar, right? And previously, this used to be the report you would look to for kind of clues onto what the government's report's going to be, the granddaddy report on Friday. Um, it's interesting to see the services industry accounting for, you know, a big portion of the gains. All of the gains. Um, yeah. uh, you know, and so it's, it's not surprising, especially at this time of year, um, for that sector. Um, but your points about wages and wage inflation cooling, and that's something that the Fed has talked about. Um, and saying, though, also that it's not the biggest issue when it comes to inflation, but you wonder if this, especially this report coming up, is that, once again, that Goldilocks jobs report mm -hmm. that the Fed would be looking for, not too hot, not too cool, labor market. And the other thing interesting out of this report that I wanted to highlight, too, is the quote from uh, Neil Richardson, the chief economist, saying that restaurants and hotels were the biggest job creators during the post-pandemic recovery, but that boost is behind us. And the return to trend in leisure and hospitality suggests the economy as a whole will see more moderate hiring and wage growth in 2024. So again, another post-pandemic trend, remember when everyone want, every restaurant, every hotel right. needed workers, right? right? We're seeing that normalizing. So then as you start to see these numbers normalize, something to think about, right? It's not, when you go out to eat, I, I think anecdotally this is playing a role, right? It when is. you go out to eat, they're finally fully staffed and you yeah. feel a little bit better about 
sort of how the restaurant is able to operate. There was a time where you felt really bad. You mean you didn't enjoy just ordering through the, the Toast app when you <laughs> yeah. go into an in-store or in-premise dining experience? Right. Oh, see, I felt bad for the workers running around. Okay, yeah. we're gonna we're gonna put a pin in our conversation, guys. We're covering jobs all week. Josh Schaefer, thanks so much for the latest on the job market. All right, we've got the CEOs of America's largest banks. They're lining up before lawmakers today in a highly anticipated appearance to try and convince Washington and the world that the banking sector is back on steady ground following the regional banking crisis earlier this year. Yahoo Finance's own Jen Schonberger joins us from Washington, D.C. with more. Jennifer, talk to us about what we can expect to hear today. Good morning. I'm here on Capitol Hill where the CEOs of the nation's largest banks just slipped in this door behind me here to sit down for what's become an annual oversight hearing of Wall Street for the Senate Banking Committee. Front and center will be the Federal Reserve's proposed capital requirements, which bank CEOs have been vigorously lobbying against. In prepared written testimony, J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon saying, quote, ironically, a proposal to mitigate risk will create even more risk in the financial system. He went on to say it will fundamentally alter the U.S. economy in ways the Federal Reserve has not studied or contemplated. Diamond warns the new capital requirements could increase mortgages and small loans to, business, to loans to small businesses, making those more expensive, while also increasing prices for consumers and for the cost of saving for retirement. CEOs from the other banks expected to echo that message. CEO of Goldman Sachs David Solomon saying in his prepared remarks that he expects capital requirements to double for market making and could hurt market functioning. But while the bank are warning about the dangers of these capital requirements. Senate Banking Committee Chair Sharon Brown saying the banks just don't want to sacrifice their profits. Brown said to say in his opening testimony, quote, let's be clear, absolutely nothing in these rules would stop your banks from making loans. The reason banks might make fewer of these good loans in the future is it doesn't make your banks as much money as the risky stuff. On the hot seat this morning, CEOs from the eight largest banks Banks in this country, including Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, and uh, BNY Mellon and State Street. Other issues that are expected to be covered, consumer issues from the debit interchange fees that ha the Fed has proposed cutting to capping credit card late fees. Back to you. All right, Jennifer, thanks so much. We know you're going to be tracking the discourse, the conversation taking place there throughout the day. Appreciate it. Everyone, we've got to track Apple this morning, ticker symbol AAPL. Once again, a $3 trillion market cap company. The tech giant surpassed the threshold for the first time since August of this year and is on track for its best yearly performance since 2020. You're seeing shares this morning up by about four tenths of a percent. A few things to really kind of look out to here going forward for Apple, especially in this current quarter. We know this is a heavy sales cycle that electronics mm -hmm. companies, none more so than Apple, which IDC is uh, projecting to get to its highest ever market share of its operating system worldwide this year. So that is one of the things to keep close tabs on here. However, it comes within the backdrop of a consumer environment where we've got even more of the cuts on expectations uh, in China, a key region for Apple. Um, and yep. us getting back to this level is really after a November that erased yeah. much of the volatility and the declines that we had seen um, in kind of the latter half of this year and the final few months uh, of of summer plus uh, early in the autumn as well yeah. here. So all of that considered Apple just getting back to some of those summer or yeah, mid-summer levels. Indeed, it's yeah. got a little bit of a holiday cheer or holiday halo mm. around it Chill right now. <laughs> it does. Uh, yeah, the Grinch did not steal Apple, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, it's it's a mark that it saw earlier this year. It's reached that milestone again. It's certainly performing better than the NASDAQ, although the NASDAQ has performed well this year. When you think about uh, how well the tech sector has done, I mean, the NASDAQ up more than 30% for the year. But Apple, yeah. The crown jewel, thanks to its crown jewel, the iPhone, which continues to just fuel gains uh, at that company. I mean, you know, so when you think about where this stock has come from, it's up more than 50 percent this year. Uh, and if you got in on it at the beginning of the year, you are sitting pretty right now. Uh, and it's, you know, we know it's been a big part of just the gains that we've seen in the Magnificent Seven and what's really just been carrying this market overall this year. Uh, so it's it's interesting to 
note that it's reached this milestone once again. Absolutely. Well, let's talk a little China here. China blue chip stocks tumbling overnight to five-year lows as traders digested Moody's Tuesday cuts to its credit outlook. The warning is the latest setback amid a shaky year for the world's second largest economy. Jared Blickery joins us now with a closer look at the overnight moves. Hey, Jared. Hey there, Brad. Well, we're looking at the U.S. dollar strengthening just a little bit against the Chinese yuan. It could have been worse. Uh, as you said, Moody's downgraded the outlook. They didn't downgrade the debt. They just changed the outlook to negative uh, from stable. What does this mean? Well, let's just think a month ago, they did something similar to the United States. This was uh, with, with respect to the United States AAA rating, though, which is higher than China's A1. But I want to get back to that decision because it was made based on two factors. Number one, the problem property sector has been an absolute disaster for the country, for the people. A lot of the population uh, has historically saved there, and that's what their savings mean, not necessarily in the stock market as it used to be, but in the property market. Those savings have been decimated, and the Chinese government has been trying to issue directed stimulus into various pockets of the economy, especially the property sector, to save it without inflating the general economy. But here's where the problem comes. Here's the U.S. dollar versus the U.N. year to date up 3.78 percent. That means the Chinese yuan has weakened against the dollar by about 4 percent. A weaker yuan means more capital outflows. That means people don't want to hold it because it's becoming devalued. And in September, that fevered pitch reached $75 billion. And that was the highest level in about seven or eight years. That was right in here at these highs. Now, keep in mind, this is a weakening yuan as we go up. Let's take a look at a max chart and see where that is historically. We are right at the highest highs going back to just before the financial crisis. Um, you can see back in the day there used to be a peg. No more. It was allowed to float within a band, but now it is threatening to break northwards. And so for that, there are traders are, who are scared of losing money in the yuan. They have bought dollars. Now, here's the good news for the Chinese uh, government. This has not spooked stocks. Now, it did initially overnight. I was looking at the tape about 8 p.m. There was uh, some wiggles, and we got a downdraft in a lot of these stocks, like pa Alibaba, Pinduoduo. But they have since risen. So it looks like the market is kind of just shrugging this off. And uh, I do want to point out one thing. Despite the bullishness that we see this morning, I'm going to take these pre-market quotes off. Uh, these stocks have suffered, and let me just show you, over the last five days, there's a lot of red there. You take into consideration what's happened in the U.S., we've seen a lot of green over the last few days. It's been kind of risk on, with, uh, except for the mega caps until yesterday. So all to be said, uh, China's just operating on its own fundamentals. You cannot, you cannot conflate the Chinese tech stocks with the U.S. stocks. But on that note, I'm going to pivot. I did kind of hint that we did have a positive day yesterday in the mega caps, which we did. Apple was up 2.11%, uh, NVIDIA up 2% as well. And I'll show you the pre-market quotes. Uh, we are bumping again. So NVIDIA up 1.32%. NVIDIA was actually down about 10% from its recent high. Uh, you don't want to say an individual stock entered a correction, but that was a meaningful decline. But we have found support and we're heading back up. So U.S. tech looking good, Chinese tech on a kind of flimsy ground here. All right. Interesting stuff to note there. Jared Blickery, thank you. All right. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You are watching Yahoo Finance. Yahoo Finance is counting down to the biggest story of 2023, but what's going to take the top spot? Whoa, 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 Josh. Inflation is clearly the top story of 2023. Now, this pizza I have right here is supposed to be $18, but we're in New York City and I added pepperoni, so it costs, get this, $29. All right, your, your pizza is more expensive, big deal. You might want to get that pie to go, though, because we all know the big story was OpenAI, ChatGPT, case closed. AI was a big buzzword, Dan. But I think we're forgetting about a big event here. Remember that regional banking crisis back in March? Remember we had JP Morgan step in and buy First Republic? Pretty big deal, Brooke. Pretty big deal. I'm kind of a big deal. I think the banking crisis might win here. All right, Josh, Brooke, Dan, I'm shoving you to the side because I think we're all forgetting about a small little cultural phenomenon known as Barbie. I mean, this is all anyone could talk about. For months, we're still talking about it. Mm, very true, but guys, guys, I think we're all right here. Stay tuned for Yahoo Finance and we'll hear what the biggest story certainly is as we count down to 2024.
Welcome back. Today's market commentary, Goldman and Morgan Stanley. We're looking at both of these. Morgan Stanley, first and foremost, giving outlook for the next Fed meeting. In a recent note, economists wrote, we expect the FOMC statement to acknowledge that economic activity has slowed. We expect little change to the description of inflation. And then, yeah, we mentioned Goldman, too. Goldman Sachs is warning investors to brace for a pullback, writing that the rally has absolutely run out of gas right now. For more on this, let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills. All right, Maddie, where should we go first here? Let's start on Goldman, because I love the main headline here is no bears left. And Scott Rudner from Goldman is saying that that's a bad thing. That means that this rally has got a little bit too much euphoria in it that's not going to carry us until the end of the year. What's interesting about his evidence for this call is that he points to commodity trading advisors pouring money into equities. He notes that there's been about $225 billion coming from CTAs into equities. He estimates that, of course, so that's coming from him that day. Uh, but when you see that group of trading advisors pouring into equities, that typically is going to be followed by a sell-off. And that mirrors some of the other data that we look at on the street, the relative strength index uh, hitting above 70, for example. Sometimes that's followed by a sell-off. Uh, he does also suggest, I think this is important to note, adding portfolio hedges to the S&P 500 as it gets to 4,600. But I think, again, just circling back to that broader point here that that there are no bears left on Wall Street. I know that we've been talking a lot about the different mm -hmm. calls from various banks uh, for their price targets for the S&P next year. So many in the 5,000 range. Uh, and Rudner is arguing here that that means there's too much euphoria and we've got to kind of pull it back a little bit. Yeah, but it is also a big if because, you know, you have that FOMO trade in play here. Uh, the other thing that I know that we're watching is this uh, note out on the December FOMC meeting from Morgan Stanley. Um, and, you know, in terms of what their expectation is, it looks like it's in line with what, what, what is generally expected. Uh, and especially when you think about the path of inflation, given the latest jobs data that we're seeing, yeah. what was your takeaway from the latest uh, note from Morgan Stanley? It feels like a little bit more of the hemming and hawing that we've been hearing from Federal Reserve officials, too. They're kind of like, yeah, we're going to see a little bit of a slowdown. The Fed's going to acknowledge that. The press conference with Powell is going to be a mirror of the same comments that he made at Spellman. But I do think what stood out to me here is that they say that policy uh, changes are expected to be on hold until June, but that disinflation numbers are going to be choppy until then. And to your great point on that, Diane, we might also see some choppiness in the labor data, too. There was a downside surprise with ADP. I wonder if that's going to continue into Friday. What will the cooling narrative of the jobs market mean for this call that we might be heading towards either a soft landing nirvana or potentially a broader slowdown? And from this uh, note from Morgan Stanley heading into the Fed meeting, it seems like the Fed is going to continue to do a little bit of commentary that leaves them open to either of those eventualities. All right. Well, of course, I mean, that's usually how it like, Keep it you know, open. we remain Main data dependent. Yeah. That's the message that we consistently hear. All right, so we'll see what they decide based on the latest data. Great stuff as usual, Madison Mills. Yeah, we appreciate you. All right, Campbell's reporting its quarterly uh, 20, Q1 2024 earnings today. The soup giant is reaffirming its full year fiscal guidance and it's expecting to close on its acquisition of Sovos brands next year. For this quarter, it beat the street's expectation, but net sales declined 2%. And its earnings per share, it's down 11%. Campbell CEO saying it's seeing an encouraging start to the holiday season and plans to build momentum by stepping up its innovation and execution for this upcoming fiscal year. And we, we can see in terms of uh, how it's being rewarded, at least in the pre-market, the stock is up in reaction to its latest results. Um, and Madison, I, I know that, you know, we're, we're going to pivot a little bit and look at a specific so stock. What stands out to you when you think about Campbell's results? today. 
You know, I think about it as an indication of the strength of the consumer, right? Is this potentially a consumer trading down to goods that are a little bit more affordable with canned soups? Uh, and what does that mean when it comes to the Fed and what they're going to be doing moving forward? Uh, they did reaffirm their full year fiscal guidance, which is always rewarded by mm -hmm. the street. And they also right. mentioned continuing on that acquisition of Sovos. That's um, Rouse. I I'm going to get dragged for yeah. how I'm pronouncing it. I know there's a lot of debate. No, I, on this. That's the pronunciation okay. I would go with. I was I was freaked out just no. now. I so <laughs> when I went sauce. into that. To, to sauce. Exactly. I, yes. should, I should have just said sauce. Goodness. That's my sauce. bad, guys. It's true. I took a swing. It's but true. Yeah. But you make a good point about just the competition from private label and, and just consume. So sure, consumer soup in general may be cheaper when you yeah. think about trade downs people are making. But then Campbell's does acknowledge that they have some private label competition. So they're seeing some volume impact down 5% in terms of the private label eating into their results. Look, at the end of the day, there's a lot of things that you could be upset about with this report. I've been blamed for being the holiday Grinch here on set too many times, <laughs> so I'm going to look at something positive. We had a primary drive from increased spend in snacks here. Snacks could be recession resilient. We'll see if they're GLP-1 That's what I would, yes. Well. But yeah. at the end of the day, the uh, increases here and some of the kind of Grinch-worthy call-outs, uh, you did see gross profit slippage. You saw some unfavorable mix that the company cited. You also saw high higher advertising and consumer mm -hmm. promotion expenses. That increased 6%. Um, but it's so that they could advertise the snacks at the end of the day. So <laughs> for yes, and they do still have some pricing power because yeah. they mm -hmm. said some of that decline in volume uh, was offset by raising prices in general. So we have seen that they still have some strength with pricing power when it comes to their products. And, you know, we also know that consumers tend to be brand loyalists as well. So that certainly yeah. helps. I mean, look, uh, I have some camels in my cupboard right now. Same, same. I was thinking <laughs> exactly. that. I was thinking that. Exactly. So, you know, so right now in terms of we'll see shortly when the market opens how would actually what the uh, initial reaction is to their latest results um, but again so we know they are facing the you know competition from private label but they are standing up to that competition with their pricing power even despite the inflationary environment that we continue to deal with um, in terms of consumer goods. Well, Absolutely. and it's the latest example of an earnings beat, which mm -hmm. I feel like is kind of the story of earnings this year. Absolutely. Yeah. We're taking a look at the opening bell here in the bottom corner of our screen on Wall Street at the NYSE. Our viewers have a look at that. We've struck 9.30 a.m. here Eastern time. Let's take a look at what is moving out of the gate this morning for that. We've got Yahoo Finance's very own Jared Blickery standing by with the heat map. Let's mm -hmm. tee it up. All right. Well, we got this map of the world here looking at green just about everywhere except for the Far East and a couple places. But we're focused on the U.S. Open. NASDAQ up two thirds of a percent out of the gate. Russell 2000, the small caps up one percent. Let's just take a look at a five day chart and see what hap what's happened. Kind of choppy action, but we have broken to the upside in this trailing week. And let's see what we're seeing inside in the sector action. I was talking about tech being strong, kind of bouncing back. Looks like consumer discretionary XLY is number one. That's up almost one percent followed by real estate, financials, then tech, industrials and utilities. Kind of a broad mix uh, just rounding out the top. Uh, to the downside, energy and staples, the only two sectors in the red. I want to check in on the bond market. We had a big drop yesterday in the 10-year T-note yield. Let me put a three-month chart with candlesticks, and we can see this is that big drop from 5%. That was the highest in years. And now we are still heading down another two basis points. This eases, this is kind of a tailwind for stocks, more the gross stocks than some of the others. But nevertheless, that's what the market is liking. Uh, went over, we looked at Chinese tech, but now I just want to focus on some of the American leaders here. And guess what? Bitcoin, that's up 5%. That is our number one uh, ticker, followed by regional banks. Then home builders are bumping here. Retail stocks, chip stocks, solar disruption, and finally, Chinese stocks as well. So it uh, looks like we're kind of off to the races. And let me just get a quick check on Bitcoin. 44,000. This guy is advancing here. Here's a two-month chart. We can really see that breakout up about 60%. All right, Jared, thanks so much. To rally or not to rally? That is the question hovering over markets at the moment. Will stocks continue the momentum we saw in November? And if they do, where should people jump in? Investors looking for opportunities may want to know about what our next guest calls 
10 bagger stocks, names that multiply their share price by a factor of 10. These stocks make up only 2.7% of 16 developed market indices over the past 10 years. Here with the names of those 10 bagger stocks is Ben Laidler, eToro, global market strategist. Uh, ben, so thank you so much for joining us again. Let's jump right into these stocks that we're really looking at to kind of take us off to the races. Yeah, so I guess it's, it's the holy grail for any investor is to find those winners and just let them run. Uh, clearly, it's more difficult than, um, uh, you know, I make it out to be. Otherwise, I'd you know, already be on my sort of yacht uh, somewhere. <laughs> but um, uh, to your point, 2.7% of global stocks are, have been 10 baggers over the last decade. Nearly 5%, interestingly, in the S&P 500, um, which is you know, one of the better hit rates globally. And, you know, we're not throwing darts on a dartboard here. There are some common denominators to try and increase your odds. Um, they tend to have very strong revenue growth, and therefore it helps to be in a sector like tech, which has this sort of structural growth. Uh, they tend to have started off with sort of mid-cap stocks, you know, big enough to take advantage of the opportunity, but small enough to have that sort of growth runway over time. And I guess thirdly, and, and maybe most interestingly, uh, they're already profitable and they have quite low valuations. And that really, you know, then gets that virtuous circle going of margins that expand, uh, investors pay more attention, they re-rate and, you know, then you get, you know, then you become that sort of 10 bagger over time. Ben, it's really interesting, you know, even as you're rattling off some of the parameters that kind of make up this 10 bagger uh, personification, if you will, of some of the tickers that you're looking across, they're not even all concentrated specifically in one region of the world. They're quite international here. Um, you know, give us a little bit more perspective on that and what investors should be keeping tabs on about the international environment for where some of these companies play in. Sure. So, so the U.S. does well. It's full of tech names. We all, you know, we've, we've all watched in awe the sort of NVIDIA story, but it's not the best. Australia has nearly twice the proportion of 10 baggers as the S&P 500. Uh, and the sector composition is completely different. It doesn't have anything to do with tech. It's all to do with mining. Uh, and a lot of these sort of lithium miners are really leading the way there, you know, riding on the back of the EV boom. Uh, Pilbara is a stock that's up 320 times over the last decade. So double what you've made uh, out of NVIDIA. Uh, but you've also made you know, great money proportionally in places like Sweden, places like Germany, markets that Maybe you don't instinctively look at all those, you know, big sort of tech juggernauts, but they've actually proportionally had more 10 baggers than, uh, than the U.S. has. And Ben, you mentioned NVIDIA. Um, is it too late for investors to get into that or is that still a strong play based on these parameters that you're looking at? And where else is it? Is it AMD? I think that's one you're a fan of. Uh, but how do you balance that out? Yeah, so if you look at the sort of the top five 10 baggers in the US over the last decade, it's NVIDIA sort of off the charts, head and shoulders above everyone else, 120 times, you know, AMD, Tesla, 30 odd times, and, uh, and then Broadcom and, and Cadence up sort of 20 odd times. Now, obviously, when you're that big already and you've already gone up that much, it's going to be very difficult to then repeat it again. That's why it tends to be those sort of mid caps that are growing very quickly that can keep, you know, doing that. But it doesn't mean that you should be bearish on these stocks. Uh, you know, I think AI has you know, moved from hype to reality. NVIDIA has actually become cheaper this year because the earnings revisions have just you know, way outpaced the, uh, you know, the stock price. So I think that's a good place to be. It just may not be another 10-bagger from here. All right, Ben Laidler, who is the eToro Global Market Strategist. Ben, always a pleasure to kick off the session with you. Thanks so much for taking some time. Well, switching gears here, let's talk a little NEO. NEO reportedly spinning off its battery manufacturing business. That is according to Reuters. The unit will seek external investors in the split, which could reportedly happen as early as the end of this year. The valuation will be decided later, and this comes after the EV maker reported its Q3 earnings this week, where it lowered its revenue guidance for the fourth quarter. Since the company was founded in 2014, it has yet to make a profit. And this amid many of the pricing wars that have impacted across the board these 
EV manufacturers and, and Neo as well as Lucid, some of those that have struggled, Rivian as well, right. to, produ to deliver and produce on many of these vehicles while also showing that they can be profitable in that effort. That's where it's going to be uh, 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 certainly at the top of minds of investors, how they're able to ultimately get so many of these vehicles into driveways, into garages, but ultimately at the end of the day, continue to see that free cash flow positive nature that they're seeking at this point in time. Right, still. exactly. And Neo has not produced that yet, yeah. um, as you just mentioned. Uh, but we were look, looking at its ADR here, because obviously it trades uh, as an ADR here in the U.S., so up more than 2%. So it is being rewarded for that decision that it's made, that made this Reuters report about spinning off its battery manufacturing unit, which wasn't originally expected. I mean, they were um, planning to originally, you know, do that in-house and, 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 and have some of it outsourced like Tesla does, uh, for instance. But this is uh, an effort, it seems, to help it become profitable sooner than, um, than where it is right now, uh, especially when you think about where Neo is and, to your point, about deliveries and what Neo needs to do to stand out in the EV space. I mean, they've delivered 55,000 vehicles in the third quarter. They need to scale, just like the other EV makers need to scale, um, and they need to uh, ship out more in order to become profitable. So, um, cutting off or spinning out that piece of the business can help them, certainly, in that respect, right? Um, and, you know, battery manufacturing doesn't have to be a big part of its business, clearly. Yeah, well, and it's all going to come back to lithium prices. Lithium prices actually getting back to some of the lowest levels we've seen since 2021. So we'll see exactly what this spells out more broadly for that EV battery production across the board here. Indeed. All right, coming up, we've got more of your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
In the weeks since the open AI leadership debacle, news about what could have transpired between its then board and CEO Sam Altman has been fast and furious. Discussions about what will happen in the AI space and how it will continue to grow, especially around the push for regulation, have been equally pressing. Our next guest believes Sam Altman's return to open AI is good for Microsoft and for software as a whole. We want to bring in RBC Capital Markets software equity analyst Rishi Jaloria to discuss more. So tell us then, I did want want to ask you the question of, is it good, is it bad, in terms of this back and forth of Sam Altman for Microsoft and for the AI space. What is your take about what it does for the whole conversation about AI? Yeah, and, and thanks so much for having me. Great to be back here in the studio after four years in person. Yeah. Um, look, I, I think obviously the ideal scenario would be none of this happened. But given everything that transpired, it's great to have Sam Altman uh, back in the seat because he is one of those visionary leaders. I put him alongside, you know, a an Elon Musk, a Steve Jobs, a Jack Dorsey type, yeah, Bill Gates, right? And, and his vision and leadership is really important to advancing AI. Now, given everything that transpired, I think it's this is the best scenario outcome for Microsoft because they have a little bit more control over their destiny. They now have a you know non-board seat, but they still have a say in things with an observer, right? Um, there's they've clearly shown that they have some level of control over OpenAI, given how they were able to get uh, uh, Sam and, and 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 everyone else back in the seat. And so I think this is great for them. The question I think then becomes: Would it have been better if they worked at Microsoft? or at OpenAI, and I actually think it might be better happening at OpenAI from at least a near-term perspective, because number one, the pace of innovation doesn't have to slow down. And number two, all of this is happening at an arm's length transaction, right? It's not happening within Microsoft. So I think OpenAI is free to innovate maybe even faster than they would have had to under Microsoft, where there would have been more guardrails, right? Not saying this is ever gonna happen, but if OpenAI invents Skynet tomorrow, Microsoft can kind of walk away and say, that's OpenAI that did that, we didn't do that. So that's where I think this is actually the best case scenario for Microsoft coming out of this. It, it, I mean, it felt like everybody's high school crush was back on the market after a long relationship uh, at the end of the day when all of this took place. All of the companies that were throwing their hat into the ring, trying to get this talent, Salesforce, you had Microsoft mm -hmm. trying to woo everybody over there, you had Oracle throwing their hat in the ring. So all of this considered, I mean, it really sets up for next year even where more of this investment could take place. To what extent are we looking at some of the potential capital expenditures that could come forward at these arms laden types of deals from mega cap tech companies next year? It's going to be massive. Um, the, remember, the amount of uh, resources required for these generative AI workloads is exponentially higher than a traditional cloud workload. By my math, it's at least five times higher, mm -hmm. uh, if not more, especially if you're talking about the training versus the inferencing part of the LLM. And so there's just a lot of capacity you have to build out in terms of actual infrastructure, GPUs. And the more that companies are trying to figure out what their actual um, generative AI strategy is, uh, experimenting with it, and those experiments turn into real use cases, you're going to see, I think, exponential growth in the usage of this underlying platform, which is a great leading indicator for the amount of CapEx that will be required. I'll also add on, remember, uh, Microsoft is already working on their own competitor too, right. uh, NVIDIA's GPUs. Uh, I believe AWS is as well. Google, I've heard, is as well. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of investment has to become to even narrow the gap, right? I mean, what Microsoft has, if you look at the specs, well behind the H100 from NVIDIA, not to say that can't close over time, but there's a lot of money that has to be put into capital expenditures. And then with these, you mentioned, would it have been better if, like, let's say Sam Altman had gone over directly to Microsoft? Is it a win-win in terms of how this ended up transpiring for Microsoft? I think so. Uh, I think, to be honest, Microsoft may have used that as a negotiation tactic uh, more than anything else. And uh, so I, th I think this is the best case scenario outcome for Microsoft because just that there's no restarting the innovation, right? If, if the whole OpenAI team had come back, they would kind of have to start from scratch, obviously remembering what they had. And that may have led to a little bit of an air pocket in, in, in innovation. But it's, I'm just really glad to see this exponential innovation in AI continue. Just lastly, what we have you here, let's pivot a little bit. In the basket of companies that you cover and that you pour so many hours, minutes, days into looking across here, what are some of the top ideas that are emerging for 2024 right now? Yeah, look, I think as I head into 2024, I want to own companies that uh, I believe are kind of de-risked in terms of expectations haven't gotten ahead of themselves. But I also want to own companies that I believe are going to be long-term winners from generative AI. So I'll toss out a couple names to you that I really like here. Um, Microsoft is kind of an obvious one. I'll put that one aside. Uh, I believe HubSpot, which is almost the anti-Salesforce, is really moving fast with AI. And I think they're in a great position to benefit from this. Uh, Viva, which sells software to pharmaceutical companies, very defensive 
offensive name, and I think they have a great opportunity to verticalize LLMs. And then I'll say Workday, another really defensive name that I think is underappreciated by investors today. Really interesting. interesting. RBC Capital Markets, Capital, uh, or excuse me, Software Equity Analyst, Rishi Jaleria. Rishi, great to have you here in studio. Thank you for having us. me. Absolutely. Thanks for taking the time here. Everyone, we've got all your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. AI has been the dominant theme in the market this year, with NVIDIA leading the charge. The stock is more than triple. AI enthusiasm has also contributed to tech leading market gains overall. But now it's raising questions about whether it's gotten too expensive. NVIDIA, for example, has a forward price to earnings ratio of 38 versus about 30 for the broader tech universe and 20 for the S&P 500. Does it belong in your portfolio? And if not, how do you play AI? We'll tell you in our new Yahoo Finance series, Goodbye or Goodbye. Three times a week, you'll get insights from investing pros on how to build your portfolio. Executives from some of the nation's largest banks are on Capitol Hill this morning to face the Senate Banking Committee. Chairman Sherrod Brown began by setting out his stall, saying that proposed regulations don't necessarily change banks' ability to lend to small business and homeowners. He commented that it might mean less profits, however, than uh, Senator Tim Scott specifically touching on the contentious higher regulatory standard known as Basel III. Now, this essentially means that banks holding more capital on the sidelines here uh, would be in focus. Jamie Dimon, actually, in his prepared comments uh, that are up on the site, says mm. that despite zero evidence that large banks in here in the U.S. are undercapitalized today, the proposed Basel III endgame rule, if enacted, would unjustifiably and unnecessarily increase capital requirements by 20 to 25 percent for the largest banks, and banks would be limited on their ability to deploy capital in times that they're most needed, and the rule will have a harmful ripple effect on the economy, markets, businesses of all sizes, and American households. Yeah, this echoes things that we've heard from Diamond before about the regulatory climate. And look, it is that one is a strong bank, the nation's number one bank. It has a strong balance sheet. We know that in terms of its ability to pivot during the regional banking crisis earlier this year and pick up the pieces. Uh, other things that stood out to me that Diamond said in some prepared testimony is in, in concern about the tightening or potential tightening of any regulatory uh, of the regulatory climate it was the concerns that the rules could be lacking um, uh, 
uh, thoughtful analysis about what the impact could be um, and that that prosperous and challenging times key to American growth and competitiveness and saying that they can't deploy capital as quickly if these regulations become tighter. Absolutely. We're going to continue to monitor this. You're seeing live shots of it in Washington, D.C. We've also got to get to one other story that we're watching here this morning. Russian President Vladimir Putin is heading to the Middle East. In the rare trip, Putin visiting both Saudi Arabia and the UAE to discuss the oil markets, world conflicts, and trade. For more on this, we've got Yahoo Finance reporter Inez Foray here with us. Inez, what do we know so far about this? Yes, uh, Brad, so this is an important trip for Vladimir Putin uh, because uh, since the invasion of Ukraine last year, the West has uh, really tried to isolate Vladimir Putin. You've had also in March, you had the International Criminal Court that had uh, issued an arrest warrant for crimes against humanity. So he hasn't taken that many trips outside of Russia since the invasion of Ukraine. So he is now going to the UAE and he's also going to Saudi Arabia. And this is important because both of those nations hadn't signed that uh, petition from the ICC, but also they are both allies of Russia and they are both OPEC plus members. So this trip comes on the heels of OPEC plus last um, week, their meeting, which uh, where they announced a deepening of sanctions. That meeting had been overshadowed uh, because of internal disagreements on further cuts. So this is an important trip for him because it shows, look, we are all united on the same page when it comes to uh, these cuts. And we are all uh, collaborating. You had some smaller countries that uh, didn't want so many cuts. Uh, they wanted to regain some market share. And if you take a look at crude, what happened with crude on the day of that meeting, crude went down. But also since those uh, cuts were announced, you have WTI that is at $70 a barrel last week, the last Thursday, WTI closed at 75 a barrel. You had Brent last Thursday that was at 82. It is now at 70, uh, it is now at 75. WTI is at $70 a barrel. And year to date, you have both WTI and Brent that are down about 8%, more than 7% year to date. So th what this is showing the market or there's what this is showing you is, is that despite these OPEC plus cuts, you are still seeing oil going down further, guys. All right. And speaking of just general patterns in the energy market, and as uh, we've also seen gas and diesel prices uh, start to decline, what can we expect in terms of the direction of that sector of energy to go? Yeah, you can expect it to continue to go down uh, until about the springtime. But I want to show you where we're at with gasoline and with diesel, because we have seen, as you mentioned, a downtrend since about mid-September. And we are continuing with that. You're looking at gasoline that's at $3.22 uh, per gallon. A month ago, it was at three forty-two. dollars Diesel today is at $4.17 a gallon. That's uh, a year ago. It was at five dollars and six cents so we're actually seeing right now a sort of acceleration of a decline when it comes to diesel and analysts are saying that you can expect supply for both fuels likely to rise if europe has a milder winter you can expect stockpiles there to increase and also china recently cut its fuel prices so this doesn't bode that well as far as demands concerned for uh, fuel what it does bode well is that you can expect to continue to see gasoline, diesel prices going lower. This should bode well also for inflation, guys. All right. And as for Ray, thank you so much for the deep dive on the energy sector. Thanks. All right. We've got more of your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. AI has been the dominant theme in the market this year with NVIDIA leading the charge. The stock is more than triple. AI enthusiasm has also contributed to tech leading market gains overall. But now it's raising questions about whether it's gotten too expensive. NVIDIA, for example, has a forward price to earnings ratio of 38 versus about 30 for the broader tech universe and 20 for the S&P 500. Does it belong in your portfolio? And if not, how do you play AI? We'll tell you in our new Yahoo Finance series, Goodbye or Goodbye. Three times a week, you'll get insights from investing pros on how to build your portfolio.
Welcome back. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brad Smith alongside Diane King Hall. We are off into the races 30 minutes into today's trading activity here. The S&P 500, we're keeping close tabs on that, up fractionally by about three tenths of a percent. Investors look to data on the health of the labor market all week long here, and especially today, tomorrow, and Friday for clues to the Federal Reserve's next policy move. Wednesday brought some fresh signs of softening, though, in the labor market as the ADP gauge on private payrolls missed ex expectations. 103,000 jobs were added in November. November. Let's take a look at some individual names. Lovesack shares, they are climbing higher today. The furniture company reporting its Q3 earnings today, narrowing its revenue guidance to the midpoint of its range. This quarter, it beat the streets revenue and EPS expectations. We're also watching shares of Plug Power. Morgan Stanley downgrading Plug Power to underweight. That's down from equal weight and cutting its price target 29% three bucks. And Shake Shack, the stock is moving higher this morning. Raymond James upgrading the fast casual restaurant to a strong buy from Outperform. The investment bank sees more upside potential to the company's store margin estimates in the months ahead. I mean, those burgers are expensive. <laughs> also, while we're in the burger lane here, yeah. McDonald's setting up an ambitious timeline. The fast food chain announced ahead of its investor day today that it plans to open more than 8,800 new locations and grow its loyalty program by 100 million members in 2027. For 2024, McDonald's says it's targeting system-wide sales growth of 2%. In one of my multitude of tabs that I have open here on the day, I'm keeping close tabs on this investor presentation that they're making. We do have some comments that were already prepared and uh, released as well, saying that there's never been a better time to be a part of the brand McDonald's, the system demonstrating exceptional execution of their accelerating the arches strategy, all about the golden arches over there, or Arcos Dorados if you're uh, Latin American. But at the end of the day, delivering results across some of those key growth pillars there, that coming from the president and chief executive officer, Chris Kimchinsky. Yeah, McDonald's. McDonald's basically saying GLP who, right? No, oh, uh, With their plans to expand. I mean, look, it, it is going to increase their CapEx. Um, they say capital expenditures will be about two and a half billion. Yeah. Uh, so that is an increase of, it says between 300 to 500 million each year uh, through 2027. So that is an increase, but they're making a big bet that people will still want their burgers. It's interesting that we went from Shake Shack to McDonald's, uh, but you know, we know McDonald's generally holds up in an inflationary uh, climate, but you know, they say they want this global footprint of 50,000 locations, yep. which is huge. Uh, and you know, so they're really doubling down on on uh, their increase in both their actual footprint and their loyalty program, right. which has seen growth as well, Brad. And it's going to come back to the menu here on this. They're talking about a few things, and, and just to for any investor out there, for anybody that's even kind of looking at the McDonald's ticker page in response to uh, this news on the day and taking a look at shares over the course of uh, the portion of this year, one of the huge things that this company is going to point back to, and since 2019, is the 30 percent comp sales growth that they've seen under this MCD, that three pillar growth program here under the Accelerating the Arches, maximizing marketing, committing to the core, doubling down on what they're calling the three D's, delivery, digital and drive through here. And specifically in that commitment to the core, last thing I'll say on this, the core menu items, Big Mac, Quarter Pounder, Chicken McNuggets, and the fries, core of their business that they're talking about and representing about 65% of the system-wide sales and driving profitable growth for the company. And it wouldn't be 2023 if we didn't have a mention yeah. of AI. And of course, that Always. is... Always. That is, you know, that is part of the conversation even here. I mean, they're saying they have this strategic partnership with Google uh, as well to unlock the latest cloud technology and apply generative AI solutions across restaurants worldwide. I mean, we have seen uh, McDonald's increase its technology footprint in general, so it's no surprise that they're leaning into the AI, particularly the generative AI space now. Uh, they say that it would, th the way they're leaning into it is it would reduce complexity for crew. It would, you know, customers would benefit from this and it would lead to, I guess, finding solutions and opportunities for innovation is what they say. So we will see what that will mean in terms of the fur further digitization of its platform. Hopefully it's not actually the food itself and that we won't be eating bits and bites. Our producers will be happy <laughs> to know that I've made it through an entire McDonald's segment without mentioning Grimace today. <laughs> you did, though, just now. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes oh you got to do it. Goodness. Oh, 
my goodness. So, yeah, I mean, we'll we'll be watching more to, to see what happens, what comes from their investor day today and what other details they give about both their sales, the expectations for sales. They are expecting that for 2024 that the new restaurant unit growth will be more than 4 percent um, and then between 4 to 5 percent annually through 2027. Uh, they are expecting a run rate of about a thousand gross restaurant openings across the U.S. and, and international markets in 2027 as well. All right, we're a few weeks away from the new year. There's a lot of uncertainty heading into 2024. More volatile macroeconomic environment paired with the possibility of higher for longer interest rates could significantly impact portfolios. So how can investors find safer opportunities during these challenging times? We want to bring in Jay Jacobs, BlackRock U.S. Head of Thematic and Active Equity ETFs. Jay, BlackRock's thematic ETF outlook reveals three key themes for 2024. So why don't you take us through the headlines with regard to those themes? Sure. The major takeaways here are, one, AI is going to be hitting really its inflection point, not just as a proof of concept, as a kind of new product on the block, but really as a product that can be commercialized, generating billions of dollars of revenue. The second area we're looking at is medical innovation. We have aging populations in the United States, around the world. We're hitting serious inflection points. Like next year, there will be more people over the age of 65 in the United States than under the age of 15. That is going to put immense pressure on our healthcare system and result in new drug development. And then finally, we're looking at the rewiring of global supply chains. How does the world look like after COVID, after the global financial crisis, after Brexit, as we start to think about what we build in the United States and what we build with key partners around the world? Jay, you know, great to get some of these kind of core themes that we're going to be watching going into next year as well. But when you think about how much has already been kind of playing itself out in the market over the course of this year, a lot of investors might ask, well, how much more growth on top of the catalyst, some of these that have been present for a few months now, are we expecting to see? Well, I think it's still early in a lot of these themes. I mean, if we look at AI, and look, I know we've been talking about AI a lot this year, a lot uh, every day. Um, really only a few companies have really gotten the AI bump. Um, it's been the Magnificent Seven. You've seen tremendous performance from those companies. But we see literally over 100 more companies that are really well positioned within the AI space to benefit from this new uh, this new technology and this greater adoption of the technology. So we look specifically at the tech stack of AI. And you can see kind of where the market has been focused and where it hasn't been focused. The market has been focused in two areas. One is the platform developers. Those are the chat GPT and the clouds and the uh, and the llamas that are developing these uh, latest platforms and it's been focused on GPU manufacturers. That is missing who is building the CPUs, which are important chips as we get more data and, and develop more and more AI systems. It's missing the digital infrastructure that's gonna benefit from the proliferation of AI that needs to happen somewhere physically using uh, data centers and warehouses. Uh, and it's missing the applications that are being built using AI. What are the, you know, if we go back to you know the mobile phone uh, explosion with 4G, you think about all the social media companies that were built on top of mobile phones, you think about all the e-commerce that's been built on top of mobile phones. What are those industries for AI? What are the next industries that are going to leverage AI to develop incredible amounts of, of, uh, of revenue? And so that's where we're looking for the opportunity beyond just the platform companies. So how do investors play it in 2024 as the space for AI continues to grow? You know, we are in the early stages still of generative AI, uh, but where do investors go especially when you think about the first quarter of 2024? I think there's really two areas to look. And one is to just say we should buy the entire value chain of AI stocks. Um, we don't know exactly who the winners or losers will be in the next quarter, but we know this is a rising tide that will lift many companies in the market. That would be great for a thematic ETF like our IRBO, which is investing in 120 companies around the world uh, that are uh, really uh, involved in AI and robotics. Uh, but it may be an even more precise way to play it is to look at the semiconductor space. Um, this has a lot of companies beyond the GPU manufacturers that are going to be in very high demand as companies build more and more AI systems. Um, so we we look to our SOXX ETF to get a really precise way of playing the semiconductor space. Hey, Jay, while we have you, I, I got to ask about one of the other themes that is kind of making a comeback here, emerging from an ice age crypto right now. How much fanfare, how much attention 
Do you expect that to take on, especially with some of the ETFs that are set to come forward? We know BlackRock is applied and, uh, and, and has its own application. I won't kind of go down that kind of hole with you. I know that there's probably some legal implications and whatnot. But at the end of the day, where do you see that emerging again, perhaps, as a theme that some investors might look to next year? Look, I mean, if we take a step back at thematic investing, a lot of areas of the market are nascent. You know, you look at how much AI has developed this year, you look at blockchain and how much it's developed over the last few years. But because these are nascent themes, they're volatile. And you can have incredible years early on. You can have, you know, what you might call a winter for some of these themes early on as well. But what we're looking at is really the long-term trajectory, taking a step back and saying, where's this theme going to be in the next 10, 15 years? Mm -hmm. That is the advantage for investors is to really take that long-term uh, look. So, you know, blockchain uh, or blockchain ETF, IBLC has had a terrific year this year. Uh, it had a challenging year last year. We would really recommend investors look at the long-term and really make a bet on this technology over uh, over many years. All right, Jay Jacobs, great insight and outlook for 2024. BlackRock U.S. Head of Thematic and Active Equity ETFs. We appreciate your time this morning. All right, we've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You are watching Yahoo Finance. Google just introduced its new generative AI model dubbed Gemini. And Yahoo Finance tech reporter Dan Holly is here with the details. So Google has entered the ring, Dan. Mm -hmm. Gemini. Mm -hmm. What do we know about how it competes, especially when you think about ChatGPT? Yeah, I mean, this will blow away ChatGPT. Uh, it's really what this is competing against is OpenAI's latest model, which mm -hmm. is GPT-4. Right. So that's what this is the, the big competitor to. Um, you know, it's what they call uh, natively multimodal. 
So think about it this way. When you have something like um, uh, a generative AI chatbot, you have them that they work with audio, text, video, um, uh, images, right? But uh, according to Google's DeepMind, those are kind of all stitched together to make one actual AI model. The big deal about this is that it's from the ground up meant to work with photo, video, audio, text, things like that. So, you know, in some of the examples they showed, uh, it was, you know, showing this AI a picture uh, of a, a hand-drawn picture of a duck, and it was able to recognize that it was a hand-drawn picture of a duck. And then when the presenter colored the duck in blue, it recognized that it was blue and said, most ducks aren't blue. And then they pulled out a rubber ducky that was blue, and it said, okay, maybe some ducks are blue. And right. It said, what material is this? And they were like, well, it looks like it's, you know, uh, some kind of rubber. And they're like, well, it float. And it goes, you know, so it's like, it understands all of this kind of stuff. It's not smart, right? It's, it's, it's based on things that it's, it's been exposed to, it's learned. It doesn't have emotion. This isn't, you know, Terminator or anything like that. Uh, just, you know, to get well, that out there. Well, you say that that it isn't Terminator, but I don't know if you remember, there was an article out earlier this this year. Um, I think it was a Kevin Roos piece where he was interacting with um, Bard, right? Um, and it started to seem to take on this, um, this persona that was just like, just just got extreme and yeah. professing love, if you, re if you remember yeah, yeah, that. Yeah. So like, you're saying it won't be the Terminator, but there is an issue when you think about guardrails, when yeah, you think yeah. about um, the, you know, what's happening with the generative AI space. So what would you say is the takeaway? So you say this is, of course, it's gonna blow away chat GPT, but what about like where open AI is now? And then in general, all the players that are developing their own like meta, their own yeah. answer to that. Yeah, so this is this is going up against GPT-4, so that's uh, OpenAI's top of the line model, right? So this is going to be a, a big deal. And the, the other thing about this is there's three versions of it. So there's the, the top end version uh, that's going to be running in servers. Uh, that's called Gemini Ultra. Then there's Gemini Pro, which is going to be for, you know, more, more casual business users. And then there's Gemini Nano, which is actually out running on the Google Pixel 8 Pro smartphone. Okay. So it's it's in devices. Uh, Bard is getting a Gemini update today. Uh, so they're they're rolling this out now. It still needs time. It's only uh, English language versions of this. Um, there was a report that they were holding it back entirely because they only had the English language version. But clearly they're they're rolling it out. And I think you know the the, the big thing to keep in mind is that you know. Unlike Microsoft, which is adding this as a value to its cloud service that makes up a, a you know a, a good bulk of its its revenue, Google is still wholly reliant on search and advertising, right? So you know they're going to add this to their their workspaces. Mm -hmm. um, they have Duet AI, uh, which is their their workspaces AI. That's going to get a Gemini boost as well. Uh, the smartphone market for for them still pretty small, right? right? It's it's all about, for them, advertising. And so they specifically point out that this is going to be going into the uh, search section, uh, as well as uh, uh, YouTube, uh, and then obviously workspaces. But it's the Google search part that's most important because right now they have something called search generative experience. It's a version of Google search that runs on generative AI. So you'll, you'll search for, you know, Yahoo Finance, you know, Dan Howley or something. Right. Uh, and it'll show, of course. It'll, it'll show very handsome, great yeah. writer, things like that. Uh, you know, so that's the generative AI version. It's also known to lie. So uh, that's <laughs> probably why it does that. Uh, but then, you know, yeah. this is going to come eventually to full search. So this is, this is basically their, their future proofing right. uh, going right. down the line. They also just need to show people that, you know, that they're in the game, the game yes. The exactly. They have an exactly. answer, exactly. Yeah. Maybe right. it will surface the uh, beard oil products that you use, too. Zero. Yahoo Finance Head and shoulders really. every day. Oh, oh my, swear. wow. Old school, all right. <laughs> Yahoo Finance's own Dan Halley helping us break down all things generative AI here this morning and the latest out of Alphabet or Google, whatever you're calling them at home. Mm -hmm. Also here, everyone, switching gears, we got to talk Time Person of the Year. This is a major recognition um, and for the person who had the most influence on the events of the year for good or for for bad. The recognition has even been given annually nearly for a century here, uh, starting with, in 1927, Charles Lindenberg. Other people of the year include Franklin Roosevelt, Adolf Hitler, Winston Churchill, Martin Luther King Jr., Elon Musk, and most recently Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. This year, 
Time is recognizing the woman who took the world by storm on stage, online, and in football stadiums even, Taylor Swift. And joining us now with the reason behind this choice, we've got the CEO of Time, Jessica Sibley. Jessica, always great to grab some time with you here on the day. Walk us into the decision here. What was the conversation like internally that ultimately netted out Taylor Swift as the Time Person of the Year? Well, Brad, I think you said it best. I mean, what a great choice this year. Our editors spent all year talking about this. It's the topic of probably every cocktail conversation, and we're just so excited. I think the world is overjoyed with what Taylor's done this year, bringing hope, bringing um, community, collaboration, and everything that she represents. We're really excited with our choice, and we're celebrating here at the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange. Jessica, so um, I actually wasn't surprised by this choice. I thought it would be Taylor. I'm not a Swifty for the record. I'm not anti for all the Swifties. Don't come for me right now. But she beat out some other key players. One person who I, I saw that was high on the list, who I know got another recognition, Sam Altman. How did Taylor uh, outstrip uh, Sam Altman? Um, and you, you had many other, the Barbie moment as well. How did she do it? Well, I mean, Taylor is so unique and remarkable what she's done, not only as a performer, as a songwriter, as an artist. I look at her as a business leader and a CEO of her own brand. And the results that she's driven are just unbelievable. You know, her Eras concert drove five billion in revenue. She's driven GDP of the U.S. economy to four billion. Just in one week in L.A., her concert drove 300 million to the local economy and created 3,000 new jobs. Uh, when you talk about her friendship bracelets, craft sales in the United States went up 500 percent. And of course, uh, talk about the NFL and Travis Kelsey, his jersey sales went up 400 percent. And she's given back. Uh, she gave 55 million to all of those that worked on her tour. And I could keep going on with these stats. Really, there wasn't um, any other choice this year, in my opinion, than Taylor Swift. Well, you had one of our faithful viewers and um, uh, producers of the show that was kind of upset that it wasn't Sam Altman. My goodness here. He still did make the list. He was the top CEO of the year for time here. When you think about generative AI, the conversation that has been, and everything around open AI, where in the consideration for time did Sam Altman really make a strong case here? I mean, he did. We've been covering Sam Altman all year. He appeared on our cover. We named um, OpenAI as one of the most important influential companies in the world right now. We're really excited to recognize Sam as the CEO of the year. He sat down, as did Taylor, to talk to us. He's had an unbelievable month, and we're really excited to have um, his story told in our pages and on time.com. And Jessica, I know there were some others, obviously, on the short list, and I know that Time also looks at groups of individuals and I saw that uh, Hollywood strikers were considered one of the groups of note in your short list. Uh, talk to us about the thinking behind that. Yeah, I mean, we had nine uh, submissions. We do polls throughout the year. Uh, I think uh, the Today Show did a poll as well. Taylor came up as number one. But there was a lot of news. There was a lot of impact made by a lot of different constituents, ideas, individuals all year long. And then just lastly, Jessica, while we have you, you think about what is perhaps going to be one of the biggest themes going into next year where you're already starting to think about the players now that could be in consideration for this same list and for this same honor of being person of the year next year. You know, we're going to be celebrating Taylor Swift for the coming hours, days, weeks. But even as we get into 2024, what are some of the key things that, that the committee and the broader kind of reader base look for in that person of the year? Yeah, well, we're going to look wide and far like we do all year. We're going to start the process uh, just as we end it and celebrate today, Taylor and everything that she's done and the Taylor effect that she's had. We're going to look at celebrities, entertainers, politicians, CEOs, and we're really excited to start the process for 2024. All right. Well, great news to hear Taylor Swift landing Time Person of the Year. Jessica Sibley, Time CEO, thank you so much for the insight. Thank you so much for having me. All right, you got it.
The stock market's fear gauge has seemed pretty fearless lately. Our very own Jared Blickery is here to tell, tell us why stock market volatility has Volatility, excuse me, has fallen from recent high. Jared, take us through the latest on the VIX. Yeah, Diane, the markets have gotten boring. I, I got to follow Taylor Swift as person of the year for Time <laughs> Magazine. That's a hard act to follow. This is the last 10 trading days in the S&P 500. It has gone a whopping 1.4% from bottom to top. This is something you actually expect to see at the end of the year. Uh, we're getting it a little bit early right now, maybe a pre-Santa Claus rally. But that does bring up the point that as volatility is supposed to drop into year end, and let me just show you our chart. This is our VIX map of the year. This shows in cyan what we expected to happen, printed at the beginning of the year, um, at, at versus what actually happened. And the purple line is what has happened and where we are right now. And we are tracking pretty closely at the bottom end of the range. Can this persist into the end of the year? Well, we'll have to see. Now, a quick reminder that Long term, when the VIX gets this low below 15, we tend to see a protracted, protracted ex expansions. This chart goes back to the early 1980s. There's one expansion, there's one expansion. All these light blue uh, dots indicate the VIX under 15, and that was a one-off. Um, this is uh, over a year, two years apart, so that was material. But I think the most part, a lot of people are expecting this VIX, this protracted VIX to persist. So if that happens, back to the main point, what happens in the S&P 500? Well, we're going to have to break this range sooner or later, and that's probably going to determine the direction into the end of the year. We have a major catalyst next week from the Federal Reserve. Um, I don't know if we can wait that long to see a breakout here, but let me just show you the year-to-date chart, and you can see why these levels are really important. Here is the high of the year that we experienced in July. We are right back up at that point, and I have noticed on Twitter there are a lot of bears, still bears out there, who are getting excited about shorting from here, but they don't have a signal yet. Um, if we do get a drop, I would definitely watch the 4,500 level. That is right in here. It's actually about right in there. 4,500 is going to be a key, but if that is defended, if we head up from there, probably get that Santa Claus melt up into the end of the year. If we break 4,500 to the downside, could be a little bit dicey. Maybe don't get that Santa Claus rally. All right. Well, I think that was a good follow, a fearless follow to <laughs> I Taylor Swift. I appreciate that, Diane. I really do. Exactly. Jared one saw Taylor Swift this year. He contributed did, to the Taylor Swift economy. Phoenix. Jared, we didn't forget that. We did. Thank you. All and right. Now, more. Good following for <laughs> Time Person of the Year, Taylor Swift. That was good, Jared. All right, Jared Blickery, thank you. We've got more of your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Boeing is poised to have its first up year in four, and it's been one of the best performers in the Dow. Analysts have gotten more bullish, and the company recently bested its longtime rival Airbus with orders at the Dubai Air Show. But troubles at Boeing's supplier Spirit Aerosystems have dogged its manufacturing process. Are those in the rearview mirror? Is the Boeing rebound for real, and does it belong in your portfolio? We'll tell you in our new Yahoo Finance series, Goodbye or Goodbye. Three times a week, you'll get insights from investing pros on how to build your portfolio.
The commercial real estate sector has been seeing some pain this year. Rates, insurance, operating costs, they've all surged in 2023. And in October, the National Association of Realtors found that commercial real estate debt continues to grow and commercial delinquency rates have been increasing as well since the last quarter of 2022. So needless to say, navigating the real estate market has become really tricky for investors. Let's bring in DWS Group co-head of global real estate, Todd Henderson, to discuss what's going on in the sector. Todd, great to have you here on set with us. Yeah, thanks for having me. So walk us through, how, how would you kind of encapsulate this year and what does that set up for going into 2024 as well? It's been a volatile year yeah. um, in terms of value more than anything. Mm -hmm. I would characterize this year as being really more of a value real estate recession than a profits recession. Mm -hmm. Fundamentals are actually quite strong. Uh, we're at the lowest levels of vacancy uh, on record, in spite of uh, what all the things that have been going on in the market. What we've seen is deterioration in value as a result of this rate cycle. But, okay, so when we think about just the, the challenges with commercial real estate, especially when you think about uh, the office sector and, and then also the debt facing the industry, there's a lot of debt that's going to come to a head. Uh, there's a number that's been talked about a lot, $1.5 trillion in debt that's going to come due by 2025 and uh, investors needing to refinance, et cetera. What does that signal about where the commercial real estate market is um, set up for 2024, how it's set up for 2024? I'm not concerned about this quote unquote wall of debt. I'm also not concerned about the overall office sector's impact on the real estate market. The office sector is uh, a very small percentage of the overall real estate market, and it represents about 1% to 3% of bank balance sheets. Banks are uh, very well capitalized. Uh, they're 40% better capitalized than they were during the global financial crisis. So a deterioration in office, a continued deterioration in, in office, which I expect will happen, I don't think is a you know, canary in the coal mine kind of event that it's going to trigger a massive sell-off in real estate, or it's going to it's going to contribute to you know serious banking uh, challenges. What I do think, though, however, is this wall of debt coming due, and additional regulation that is coming for the banks is changing the dynamic of who provides credit mm. to the marketplace. The traditional providers of credit is shrinking. Mm. The banks are not going to provide as much real estate credit in the past. So private credit from firms like ours and others, uh, it's a great opportunity for us to get into the market and we think um, generate outsized risk adjusted returns in the debt space. It's, it seems like the credit conditions though as well as we're, as we're talking about this, that could be one of the headwinds that impacts as well construction going into the commercial real estate market. How are you identifying looking across that? It's a great point. Um, what we've seen in terms of construction and frankly it's the reason why I'm so bullish on the real estate market going forward, particularly in the industrial space and the multifamily or residential space. Mm. Construction in the industrial space, new starts are down 75% from, from their peak, which was a little over a year ago. 65% in um, the residential sector, in multifamily, in apartments. I think what you'll see in 2024 is this narrative that has really already started in multifamily, and that is, well, it, um, uh, rental rates have stalled or they're even falling. It's a speed bump, frankly, along the way, because it's not a demand problem, it's a supply problem. Right now, we've delivered so much, uh, we've, the highest level of supply we've ever delivered in the multifamily space, but because we new starts are so low in 2025, we'll be at barely being able to keep up with obsolescence in terms of supply. Since there's a supply problem in multifamily, um, and when you think about that compared to like the uh, sector that's having challenges in commercial real estate office, mm -hmm. and some of that has to do with this bodies not being back in buildings. That's right. Um, does the conversion strategy work? Can that really be a, a real solution to the, the problems that they're having on both sides of this? Simply no. Why not? And the reason is because it, uh, it, a very small percentage of office buildings um, lend themselves to conversion. Um, you need plumbing, you need floor plan layout. There's a lot of the, the construction of a number of the buildings will not support it. So it's, it's the, the conversion from office to residential is not a solution. 
broadly speaking, mm -hmm. for the office sector. Um, there are some buildings, but it, 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 it's not going to be the nirvana mm -hmm. and solve the office problem. What's going to solve the housing problem in the United States is more housing being built. That's the structural um, tailwind, if you will, to those of us that are investing in residential real estate. Even though there's a fair amount of supply, a high level supply in the market today, 2025, there's going to be very little supply and the backdrop is we're already short in terms of housing mm -hmm. and it's very expensive to own relative to, to rent. All these factors are really setting up well for the performance of the multifamily sector in 2025 and beyond. Builders for in that sector. All right, we'll have to put a pin in our conversation. All right, thank you so much for joining us today. Yes. Todd Henderson, DWS Group, co-head uh, co of Global Real Estate. Thanks, Todd. Thank you. All right, Disney's proxy battle is heating up with activist investor and core calling for the media giant to add Nelson Peltz to its board. This comes after Peltz and his firm try and launch their latest proxy fight against Disney last week. We want to bring in Yahoo Finance's Ali Canal for the latest in this battle. Ali? Yeah, so more pressure for CEO Bob Iger, like you said, this time from Ancora. Now, Ancora is a wealth management firm and has $8.7 billion in assets under its control, but it really wants Nelson Peltz to be on this board. They wrote a letter to shareholders saying in part, quote, we believe Disney is saying the right things about restructuring and transforming the enterprise. Nonetheless, the addition of a shareholder representative or investor designated directors to the board can help ensure that these efforts are carried out in the most effective way. Now, the firm said that all the issues that Disney has or the bulk of the issues that Disney has largely stems from the current board. Now, that includes things like that dismal box box office performance, those escalating streaming losses. Uh, this Ancora also accused the board of politicizing the brand, uh, referencing that ongoing political battle with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. And this is all coming after Tryon launched that proxy fight last right. week and Tryon told Yahoo Finance that they are seeking multiple board seats here, including one for Nelson Peltz. CEO Bob Iger, he's talked about this at the New York Times Dealbook Summit. He said that this is something that they're going to have to continue to to contend with, but that he's not going to be distracted by all of this right now because there are much more pressing issues at the company. So just an, another, a lot of noise, I think, around this company, especially heading into the new year. Yeah, we talk about reboots all the time within the entertainment sector. This mm. is a reboot of the activist yes. era mm. and all in the same year for Disney as well mm. here. You know, separately here that we've been tracking and we know you have as well, there's been some movement on the SAG after uh, contract voting as yes. well. What do we know there? Hollywood is back in business, yeah. baby. Okay, uh, there's you. <laughs> members officially yes. voting to ratify this new multi-year contract overwhelmingly in a vote by uh, 78.33% to 21.6% with a voter turnout of around 40%. Now, SAG-AFTRA, they have been working on these protections. This strike, which lasted 118 days, officially ended in November. The contract that they came up with is valued at over $1 billion. It includes, quote, above pattern minimum compensation increase also unprecedented provisions when it comes to protections surrounding the use of artificial intelligence. So the union has really described this as a landmark deal moving forward. Uh, you know, that being said, though, there's been a lot of pain in Hollywood yeah. leading up to this. We saw the delays of several big blockbuster films. 45,000 jobs were lost in right. the entertainment sector. So despite us reaching this point, yeah. the writer strike ended in October, there is still going to be a little bit of a lingering effect, especially yeah. when you think about the cost to the economy overall. Right, and one of the sticking points had been over AI. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny, you're talking about um, uh, what's happened with the contract? I keep getting robocalls yeah. from them about the contract, and it's mm -hmm. and they made the same points you did about this. You know, it's a billion dollar um, plan of funding with regard to wages and benefits. Of course, it's AI transcribing the mm -hmm. message that mm -hmm. I got. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, AI was a big sticking point for the writers mm -hmm. as well, and, and that was why we saw these negotiations last a long time. But you hear from the studios now, and Ted Sarandos, he was just at the UBS conference the other day, and he's started off by saying, first and foremost, I want to talk about this strike and how we right. are so happy that this strike is officially over. Yeah, right. was the elephant in the room for quite yeah. some time here. So finally getting ratified, it looks like. Ali, thanks so much Thank for joining you. us to break this down. Appreciate it. Everyone coming up, we've got all your markets action straight ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Executives from some of the nation's largest banks are on Capitol Hill this morning facing off with the Senate Banking Committee. Chairman Sherrod Brown and Senator Tim Scott kicked things off by saying proposed regulations don't change banks' ability to lend to small businesses and homeowners. They also touched on the contentious higher regulatory standard known as Basel III. The CEOs have given their opening remarks. J.P. Morgan Chase's Jamie Dimon saying, quote, in troubled times, large banks support orderly capital markets to protect Americans. A Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan saying it's, quote, risk management is agile and the balance sheet continues to be supported by high levels of capital and liquidity. And in her own comments, Citigroup's Jane Frazier touched on something the senators had discussed at the open, big banks' effort to meet housing and small business demand. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, the bellies and the business of bellies out there. The drive through chain taking on quick service restaurants. Salad and Go is looking to battle the likes of Sweet Green and Cava with its drive through only concept. The chain looking to more than double its footprint next year and push its cheaper pricing model as consumers grapple with inflation. Charlie Morrison, Salad and Go CEO, joins us now live in Living Color in studio alongside Yahoo Finance's executive editor, Brian Sazi. Great to have you here with us, first and foremost. I mean, this is here. some amazing work that you and the team are doing. Why decide to go this route, this direction, for what is a very becoming increasingly crowded space in the salads? Well, I think there are a lot of people out there that sell salads. There are a few chains around that are coming along. Yeah. Um, but it's a pretty fragmented market right now. If you look at it, there's no one of really any size and scale that really has developed a brand that can put thousands of locations in the ground. We believe we've done that. At Salad & Go, we have a concept that's built on a double drive through um, Our focus is providing fresh and healthy food that's affordable and convenient for everybody. And affordability is a big key to it. We sell a salad with protein in a 48-ounce bowl for under $7. We add a drink for another $1.49, and our focus is making sure that customers have access to really healthy food that is affordable for them. And today, nobody's doing that, so we believe while it might be a fragmented market, salads are on every menu in America, we're the ones who are going to really create the organization that's gonna make everybody have access to that great healthy food. And Charlie, I should mention, you really helped build Wingstop from the ground floor, well over, what, a thousand locations, so you are no uh, new but to what you're doing over at your new company. But why is it so expensive to go out now? I walk down the street, I go to Chops, I mean, you're over $24 a salad. I showed you my order coming in last night for Panera Bread. $73.56 to have two sandwiches and two soups delivered. I will take this offline. Okay. Yes. Why, why are these companies charging these prices and are consumers finally balking? Well, I think the model, in a sense, might be broken. Um, the challenge today with high labor costs, with the supply chain challenges we've had over the last couple of years, has driven up costs dramatically. And what needs to happen is we need to retool and think differently about this. The way we've built this model at Salad & Go is to have a central kitchen, a large commissary, where we actually bring all the produce in direct from the growers, so straight from the field. We make that, we prepare it, wash it, cut it, and make it available to our stores. Our stores are only 750 square feet in size. It's all about assembly of that salad to order. And that takes a lot of pressure off the cost structure. So less labor in the stores. We redeploy the specialized labor into our food production facilities. And when we do that, we can pay them over $20 an hour for very specialized, high care focused uh, execution. It simplifies the model and allows us to charge that lower price. I think if you're tasked with a large kitchen in your restaurant and the need to staff that, it's a real challenge for this industry and one that we have to overcome. So with your expansion plans, when you think about the coasts in particular, because we're talking about the prices that we pay here in New York, and mm -hmm. things do tend to be more expensive, say, in New York or on the West Coast, can you keep up that price? I mean, I love that price, but is it realistic when you think about expanding and potentially expanding to the coast? Well, we're in markets like Phoenix today, Las Vegas. We're heading into Southern California, and we'll work our way up through the country. Um, I think each market has a differentiated price point based on the costs in those markets, and that's reasonable. But the relative price of what we charge, even against other competing options in all those markets, will be dramatically less, as much as 50% or more less. And it's all about that model. So that model is the same model we're going to use everywhere. Real estate is real estate where it is. Um, we're going to continue to uh, uh, be able to charge a much, much lower price no matter where we go.
We, we've seen a lot of focus on people who are eating less because of some of the weight loss drugs out sure. there. Does that mean they're going to salads more, going to lighter options? And, you know, how do you kind of look across the environment that is right now and assess where that consumer appetite is still going to remain strong? Yeah, I think today's consumer, if you look across the broad landscape, is is given options that are unhealthy for them, um, that are also affordable. What we can do is bridge that gap, even if the drugs weren't available to help them in their weight loss, we can provide them with access to a healthy meal that can be um, that can help and aid in that with that weight loss. But if they do uh, choose to use one of these drugs, definitely their amount, the amount they're consuming will be less, mm -hmm. but it's more about the healthy choice as well. And they want that. They just can't find access to it. And I think that's a big thing we can solve. When's the IPO? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, yeah, you've seen the response to COV. It's been, been through the roof. It's been fantastic, and they're a great company. Um, and I think it's a great demonstration that healthy uh, options uh, are something consumers want and investors are looking for as well. The great, the great public companies are going to be the ones that have a very predictable, scalable uh, platform. We believe we're in a company that exists in a category by itself now. There's salads on every menu, as I mentioned before but there's not one chain that can really grow at the pace that we think we can to grow this business and, and make it you know, a, uh, a leading company in the future. Public markets or otherwise, um, our number one goal is to make fresh and healthy food affordable and convenient for everybody. Well, I love that theme. I, for one, love I'm going to show you my yes. $73 Panera. I, that's why I'm it like, actually happened. what, I what him were show you, you doing? And also, where are our salaries? You can't even <laughs> blame that on inflation. <laughs> no, it's just my stupid self. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to have to bookmark our conversation. Thank you for joining Thank us you. today. Charlie Morrison, Salad & Go CEO, alongside Yahoo Finance Zone Executive Editor Brian Sazi. We've got more of your markets action ahead. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance. Yahoo Finance is counting down to the biggest story of 2023, but what's gonna take the top spot? Whoa, 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 Josh. Inflation is clearly the top story of 2023. Now this pizza I have right here is supposed to be $18, but we're in New York City and I added pepperoni, so it costs, get this, $29. All right, your, your pizza is more expensive, big deal. You might want to get that pie to go, though, because we all know the big story was OpenAI, ChatGPT, case closed. AI was a big buzzword, Dan, but I think we're forgetting about a big event here. Remember that regional banking crisis back in March? Remember we had JP Morgan step in and buy First Republic? Pretty big deal, Brooke, pretty big deal. <laughs> kind of a big deal. I think the banking crisis might win here. All right, Josh, Brooke, Dan, I'm shoving you to the side because I think we're all forgetting about a small little cultural phenomenon known as Barbie. I mean, this is all anyone could talk about. For months, we're still talking about it. Mm, very true, but guys, guys, I think we're all right here. Stay tuned for Yahoo Finance and we'll hear what the biggest story certainly is as we count down to 2024.
The weight loss drug market just got a little bit more crowded. Eli Lilly's ZepBound is now available in the U.S. The new weight loss drug offers another option for patients dealing with shortages of rival medications like Novo Nordisk Wagovi. Pharmaceutical companies have been hard at work this year trying to keep up with skyrocketing demand for the medications and the drugs could be used for more than just weight management. As reports surface that these medications may help curb addictions beyond just food. So not surprised to see another one entering the ring when you think about the weight loss market and how we've been talking about this throughout this year. We know J.P. Morgan Chase projecting this to be a more than $100 billion market yeah. by 2032. I think it's the year that they're projecting this. I mean, it's already a multi-billion dollar market for these. And you have that shortage with regard to Regovi, so it creates room for other, whether it's injectables or a quote-unquote magic pill. <laughs> oh, jeez. Um, you know, wh whether or not somebody wants to call it magical or not, that's on them. But I think for what we're going to be watching for Eli Lilly and the companies that are continuing to try and capitalize on this craze around some of the obesity and, and weight mm -hmm. loss drugs and puts even more focus on not just the health status of, of a lot of people, too, because there are longer-term implications. We won't go down that rabbit hole. But at the end of the day, for the companies, Eli, Eli Lilly particularly saying, today opens another chapter for adults living with obesity who have been looking for a new treatment option like ZepBound, uh, that coming from the group vice president of diabetes, uh, diabetes excuse me, and obesity. Um, they're also looking to expand the availability of this into more pharmacies as well. Um, first step there, but working with some of the employers, working with government as well, uh, and healthcare industry partners. There, there's a range of kind of red tape that these companies have had to make yeah. sure that they're correctly navigating around in order to cut down the prices uh, for those who are looking to take on one of these drugs. Um, may be eligible to pay as low as $25 for a one-month or three-month prescription. Mm -hmm. So the pricing is going to be coming more in focus, mm -hmm. even as the wave has certainly taken center stage over the course yeah, of this and year. Yeah, and terzipatide, excuse me, oh, yeah. Rolls um, off the has, <laughs> has, has already been, I mean, it's the active ingredient in um, Zepan. So it has all, it's been approved by the U.S. FDA, and it's already been in use in Manjaro. And we know Manjaro is waiting for approval to actually, uh, for the indication of treating um, obesity, et cetera, as well. So this is certainly another step in that treatment process. Uh, it's intended for adults with a BMI of 30 or higher, but apparently it can also be prescribed for people who are just overweight. So, again, another player trying to kind of reach into this space where demand has certainly rapidly increase for these weight loss drugs. Yeah, absolutely. Well, as Kesha would say, your love is my drug. At the end of the day, uh, let's take a look at some of the major averages here as we wrap up today's show. Taking a look at the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ. You're seeing gains across the board as of right now. The Dow higher by about one-tenth of a percent, S&P 500 by about two-tenths of a percent. We'll round that off too. And then additionally, you've got the NASDAQ composite in positive territory by about a quarter of a percent here on the day. We've got even more economic news that's going to be coming out over the next two Two days. You've got, of course, jobless claims tomorrow, Thursday, and then on Friday, we've got, of course, special coverage of the U.S. employment situation, the jobs report. And as we take a look at some of the sectors to round out today's show, energy pulling up the caboose, utilities leading. That's it for us today. Akiko Fujita and Rochelle Akufo have you for the next hour of trading.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It is 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Akiko Fujita along with Rochelle Akufo. Here's what we're watching at this hour. Private employers added 103,000 jobs in November, according to ADP, a sharp slowdown from the month before. As we look ahead to Friday's jobs report, are further signs of a cooling labor market coming? Indeed, and bank CEOs on Capitol Hill to testify before the Senate Banking Committee, including J.P. Morgan's Jamie Dimon and City's Jane Fraser, will bring in an update live on site. Plus, there's a new venue in town, Las Vegas's Sphere, giving consumers a new live entertainment experience. But how much money is it really bringing in? We're going to be discussing later in the show. Indeed. But first, let's take a look at how the markets are faring an hour and a half into the trading day. Looking at some gains across the board, although not quite what we saw this morning after that softer jobs data injected some enthusiasm here. But the Dow currently up about 42 points. We're looking at the S&P 500. They're also up relatively flat, about six points on the day. Take every Nasdaq there, up about 33 points on the day, or about 0.2%. Let's also check in on what we're seeing with Treasuries as well as we await, of course, that all-important jobs number on Friday as well. We're seeing this retreat here from the five-year yield down 0.6%. The 10-year still retreating, currently at 411 right now, down 1.37% on the day. And the longest-term 30-year yield down 1.84%. First, though, Rochelle, we are keeping a close watch on what's playing out in D.C. About an hour into Wall Street bankers testifying before the Senate Banking Oversight Committee, specifically on the stability of the U.S. banking system. Our very own Jen Schomberger is on Capitol Hill this morning with the very latest. Jen. Good morning, Akiko. I am indeed here on Capitol Hill, where the CEOs of the nation's largest banks are testifying right behind me, making their case against the proposed capital requirements, saying it would hurt lending, it would hurt the economy, and it would increase inflation. Here for reaction, I would like to bring in Meredith Whitney, CEO of Meredith Whitney Advisory Group. You were just down there in the hearing listening. Your reaction. Um, it's a very expensive meeting, right? Then it's a, probably a misallocation of, of time for these guys, but they, they show up on the Hill every year to do this event. Um, and um, look, they've made their, their case very clear. This has taken t 10 years, 10 years in the making, and it's absolutely ham-fisted. Ham um, I'll quote Jamie Dimon, who said that planning, uh, sorry, sorry, proposing and then studying later is a very dangerous um, uh, strategy. And what they mean by that is they're asking these questions about what Basel III endgame increased capital will do to lending, specifically lending to small businesses and low-income um, consumers. And it's it's bad, right? Because um, uh, as you drive more banking out of the regulated banking system and into the non-regulated banking system that isn't required to invest in, community, in the Community Reinvestment Act, um, you have more of that going to predatory lenders and lending will just become that much more expensive. And I think that's what you've seen over the last 10 years, 12 years, whereas these guys used to dominate the mortgage industry, and now 70% of the mortgage industry is done outside of the banking system. So that's just one example. Um, one of the things that they talked about is access to to mortgages for first-time mortgages, a uh, mortgage as uh, first-time home buyers, which has been a really focus that I, uh, an area that I've been focusing on for the past year, which is, uh, you know, mortgages and home ownership is, you know, at the lowest it's been in terms of for younger, um, uh, younger uh, uh, individuals and um, home ownership. It, the average homeowner is getting older and older and older. So it's a, it's a very important issue and should be a very important issue for these senators because that's their constituents. Um, yet. The proposals under the system, under the Basel III uh, endgame proposal, um, are going to hurt the consumer. That's just a, uh, just a fact. One thing that impresses me is um, how politicized this has been in terms of you have senators only showing up when they're going to be on camera. And the senators that are in, in the room aren't paying attention. And so when um, the CEOs were giving formal presentations, you had senators moving around and talking to each other. So this is why I'm here, because you need to read the, read the room. And it doesn't seem as if the, it doesn't seem as if um, the proposers of this, uh, of this really damaging legislation are taking it that seriously, whereas the impact for the banks at hand is significant. 
you think this is going to create more risk in the financial system? You mentioned the notion of a lot of activity moving out of the regulated banking sector. No, no, I don't think there's going to be risk for the system. I think the risk is for the U.S. consumer, which is going to be capital is going to be harder to come by for small businesses and and cons and the individual, and it's going to be more expensive. So that's the risk. It's not systemic risk by any measure. I think in the, within the banking How industry. How much more expensive are we going to see mortgages as a result of this? How is that going to impact housing? I think you could see. <clears throat> well, for starters, I think it, this is for first-time buyers. So um, housing, I think, is going to go down. We've discussed this um, in 2024 because I think that what now is a demand supply imbalance is going to in invert and it will be supply-demand imbalance. And, you know, 40 percent of, um, of homeowners don't have a mortgage, and those are the older homeowners. These are the, what we're talking about in terms of it's first-time um, buyers and the availability of mortgages for them. Mm -hmm. um, I think you could see, you know, uh, um, it depends on where rates are in terms of the percentage increase, but where they are now, a 25, 30 percent increase in, in mortgage rates. Okay, so then, given that, do you, you seems like this is going to come more, cause more harm than good. Do you think that these capital requirements are needed? Should they be completely started again from scratch? I want to explain something in the simplest terms. So um, banks have been, since the crisis, have been um, required to increase capital, and it's sort of a layer on of capital. You have the SIFI buffer, you have, you have the, the regulatory capital that they've always had to have, then you have the SIFI buffer. And this proposal is basically 25 percent increased capital on top of that. Now, the, the Basel III endgame, which will apply to the European banks and all non-U.S. banks, they're just starting from scratch with that. So you're adding that level, an additional level to the bank's capital that they're already well capitalized. So I don't think that any of this additional capital would have prevented Silicon ba Valley uh, a bank failure or there anything necessarily systemic. What Brian Moynihan, had, uh, CEO of Bank America, said is basically the increased capital proposal will just require the banks hold more capital and lend the equivalent less capital out in the system. System That doesn't help anybody. And I don't think that's what American um, consumers or voters want. There is also talk about a lot of this higher capital flowing through to hedging that is going to hit the consumer. Do you think that this proposal oh, no, no, will this be is, inflationary? This is exactly what I was talking about. Inflationary insofar as cost of capital will just be higher. So that, from an inflation standpoint, that, from that perspective, uh, yes, in terms of it will be exp more expensive for many people to access credit. Meredith, thank you so much thank for your insight. So, so appreciate having you here right on the scene. That's Meredith Whitney, CEO of Whitney Advisory Group. I'll send it back to you guys. Okay, Jen Schomburg, Jen Schomburger continuing to track the very latest on Capitol Hill there alongside Meredith Whitney. Our thanks to both of you. Um, Rochelle, you know, worth sort of putting this in context as we talk about the, the key stories we're watching today. Um, you know, we heard Meredith Whitney talk about Basel III Endgame. And for those who have not been following, this is a regulatory framework that has been put forward by regulators essentially uh, to, to stabilize the financial system as they see it. Now, what bank CEOs are contending with specifically are the capital requirements that are in place. And you heard Meredith Whitney there say, look, if you take some of that capital out of the system, this is going to be a net negative economically. Now, we've heard from seven major CEOs they're testifying right now. Worth noting uh, Jamie Dimon's comments here in prepared testimony earlier saying that this specifically would unjustifiably and necessarily increase capital requirements by 20 to 25 percent. He says the rule will have a harmful ripple effect on the economy, markets, and business of all sizes. Of course, from the regulatory standpoint, you kind of heard Sherrod Brown kind of express it and say, look, those of you who are out there, raise your hands if you can't meet the, cap meet the capital requirements. None of them did. And his argument being that you want that money because of the profits, not necessarily for the stability of the system. So an interesting debate playing out um, for those who haven't necessarily been following all of this. It's true. I mean, you figure for, for some of these senators, it really is about better transparency, better sensitivity to risk, seeing it down the pipeline. So it was interesting to see Meredith Whitney saying that even, even with these things in place, it wouldn't have avoided the collapse that we saw with Silicon Valley Bank. So clearly some trying to get some advice here from some of these, you know, big banking leaders here. But as she was saying there, when, in terms of reading the room, she said some of these senators not really paying attention here. So some of it perhaps to please constituents who want to hold some of these big banks' feet to the fire, but it doesn't seem to be getting through here. So it'll be interesting to see how this plays out and if we actually see any developments from here or perhaps any changes to the Basel III. 
Yeah, I well, mean, of I course, you know, do... sort of when you when you think about what Meredith Whitney is talking about, she is representing sort of the point of view of the banks. Important to to point that out as well. And you bring up a good point, which is this discussion is all happening elevated, amplified, especially because what happened earlier this year with Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic. Well, I also want to switch gears and take a look at another story that I'm keeping an eye on this morning, the looming death of cigarettes. Now, British American Tobacco said it may take a $31 billion hit as it writes down the value of some of its U.S. cigarette brands. The maker of Lucky Strike and Dunhill cigarettes pointed to macroeconomic headwinds for the company as inflation pushes customers towards cheaper brands and vapes. Now, according to a spokesperson, in terms of the specific brands, Newport, Camel, Pall Mall, and Natural American Spirit would be affected. Now, now, to be clear, this doesn't affect the day-to-day -day operations, but it's really about investors honing in on the long-term implications here, which is why we saw the stock really taking a hit this morning. I thought it was interesting because there seems to be sort of mixed messaging coming from analysts here. Even though they acknowledge some of the pressure that you're seeing regulators cracking down on some of these, especially in the UK, but globally we're seeing this crackdown when it comes to cigarettes. Also, they mentioned this use of illegal vapes taking a, a chunk out of the bottom line here. And then obviously people trying to have healthier lifestyles. And so we've seen BAT really try and broaden some of its horizons here, which is why even though it's taking this hit in terms of how it values this based on what people are willing to spend, it's, it's not going to be this $80 billion on the balance sheet that they had been um, expecting. Um, but then they have now shifted to looking at generating revenues through vaping and some of their non-cigarette options as well, which is why analysts at Jeffrey's saying, look, people are being too negative about it. Yes, there are some downsides to the cigarette business, but there are some other parts of the business that should perhaps be getting some attention. Meanwhile, RBC Capital Markets said the outlook somewhat grim for British American tobacco. So I guess depending on which side you're focusing on, if you're focusing on the future of disposable vapes versus the actual future of the bread and butter of their business, which was traditional cigarettes, it, it's a tough one to measure here. I mean, at the end of the day, it, it is just a downward decline, right? I mean, those, that chart pretty much says it because of regulation, where things are today. I mean, things don't look good for a lot of these companies. And you point to what happened with British American Tobacco, but you see Philip Morris and Altria d down on the back of this as well. Um, you've got to wonder how much gener uh, revenue you can certainly generate from vapes. And this is something that we have seen tobacco companies trying to get that right mix, haven't been able to land on that because at the end of the day, I don't know, Rochelle, I don't know how much cigarettes cost today, but it has been a steady decline for a lot of these companies trying to find a better mix in this current environment. It's true. And the chief executive saying they actually have an ambitious target of generating 50 percent of its revenues from non-combustibles, so non-cigarettes and some of these vapes by 2025 and because of this, this new mix that they're looking at here. But the, the, the trend is clearly going down that people are just not willing to buy the cigarettes and certainly when money's already tight, not, not able to spend on it as well. Well, one of the biggest debates among strategists and economists right now heading into 2024 is when the Federal Reserve should and will begin cutting rates. And the Financial Times polled several leading academic economists and found that most believe the Fed will keep rates at their current 22-year high until at least July. Now, almost two-thirds thought the central bank would only start cutting its benchmark rate by the third quarter of 2024 or later. And so you have this difference between what economists think will happen and then what the markets are expecting to happen. Some of these projections of when the Fed will start cutting rates being pushed up to March of 2024, even though the Fed has been very clear they're not even having that discussion at the moment, Akiko. Yeah, certainly this ongoing push and pull that we continue to see. Uh, Jeffrey's one of those certainly doesn't seem to agree with the economists polled by the Financial Times who see rate cuts starting late in the year and being very limited. Economists at the firm say in a note that they expect the Fed to make its first cut in March and continue cutting at the four subsequent meetings until the benchmark rate hits 2.75 to 3 percent. Here to break down the reasoning behind all of that, let's bring in Thomas Simmons, Jeffrey's senior U.S. economist. Um, Thomas, just walk me through that case then. Uh, the trajectory that you're seeing, what justifies that given what the economic data points to? currently. Hi, yeah, uh, good morning and thank you for having me. Uh, there are basically two sort of vectors at work with trying to figure out the, uh, the policy outlook, right? There's one that was just recently brought up by Fed Governor Waller last week that I think got quite a bit of attention, which is this notion that as long as inf inflation is decelerating, 
Maintaining a certain high level of the funds rate, say 5.5% where it is now, puts increasing pressure on the economy through an increasing real Fed funds rate, right? So if we're seeing some signs that inflation is slowing, which I agree with, um, and we are thinking about how much longer we can maintain this gap, it would seem that the beginning of next year, right at the end of Q1 in March, makes sense to me for when they might be motivated to try to make a sort of a maintenance cut uh, to try to make sure that they don't put undue pressure on the economy. Now, also in our outlook is a pretty more significantly negative view on growth than most of our competitors. Uh, my view has been generally that the, the consumer is significantly overextended in how much they're spending, uh, the savings rate hovering just around 3%. And I think that businesses so far have been happy to maintain relatively high employment because of that spending. But once one of those legs starts to wobble, I think that that's, that's the beginning of the end for this labor market cycle. So if the Fed is looking at some lagged data, they'll be thinking that they're still on this glide path towards the, or the golden path or whatever they've been talking about uh, at the end of Q1. But I think by the time we get into May and those subsequent meetings that you referenced, uh, by then they'll be chasing a labor market that's uh, weakening more rapidly. So Thomas, why haven't we seen the consumer pull back significantly yet? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things just within the data. Uh, you know, there's been some, uh, you know, sort of key numbers that have been revised and shown that consumers just had, had a lot more cash than, uh, than we thought, right? Uh, and also, I think that as we were looking at the sort of traditional monetary frameworks with interest rates and trying to interpret how that was going to affect the incentives on consumers and eventually their behavior, what we found is that it, it, it doesn't really work the same way when you raise rates really, really fast, right? One of the things I point to very frequently is thinking about how the housing market would behave in a rising rate environment. Usually you would think, okay, higher rates, a little bit less demand, that's gonna be putting downward pressure on prices, sales slow down a little bit. That's what happens when you raise rates a little bit and someone has a 4% mortgage and someone has a 5% mortgage and then they go for a 6%, et cetera. But when you have the labor market, I'm sorry, the housing market just kind of slammed to a halt when rates started going up really sharply, you have a lot of people with a 4% mortgage and a very narrow number of people with a 7% mortgage. And then as you know, we referenced in the previous segment, there's this supply demand imbalance where you've ended up kind of killing supply faster than you killed demand. So prices go back up. Uh, there's just a lot of things that have sort of worked out that way that we've you know, thought that they were going to lead to these more kind of logical processes. But instead, it, you know, we, we find that there isn't a linear sort of path for consumer behavior. It's like they can continue to do something for a while until all of a sudden it's no longer possible and then they have to pull back. And I think that some of these things like Black Friday sales largely being fueled by non-credit card, buy now, pay later type things are, are a good example of that starting to happen. Uh, Thomas, you know, the next data set we're looking to, obviously the big jobs report coming out on Friday, we got a bit of a preview today with the ADP numbers. If we take that data as it is, mm -hmm. it points to slowdown in the labor market. Um, how much more of the lag factor are we likely to see? In other words, if we're already seeing the slowdown, the concern has been that the Fed policy hasn't necessarily shown its sign until more recently. Is there a concern that this aggressive rate hiking cycle we've seen up until now could really start to clamp down on some of those numbers in the months ahead? I think so, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I, one of the things I've really struggled with this whole year is trying to identify some kind of very clear and direct correlation between Fed policy and some sort of economic data, right? So, you know, you have higher rates, but, you know, the housing market we discussed didn't work out the right way. Same thing with consumer borrowing. You know, they sort of raised rates and borrowing has actually picked up because we've been battling against inflation. It's sort of the only way that consumers can, can keep up. Um, as it relates to the labor market data, I think that we, you know, are struggling a lot with quality of the data. Uh, I've, you know, for a long time kind of been bothered by paying attention to ADP because it can, can be pretty misleading when you're thinking about setting expectations for the following Friday. Uh, of course, last month that was not the case. We had about, a, I think, maybe less than 10,000, uh, you know, difference between where ADP and private payrolls showed up. Uh, but in the months before that, you had misses of, you know, basically one overestimate in the 350K range and one underestimate in the 150K range. So uh, I think that there's a lot of noise in the data. You know, we see con uh, jobless claims that have kind of decoupled from continuing claims. Is that a sign that there's more friction developing in the labor market and people are having a hard time finding a new job? Uh, or is it just seasonal adjustment problems, right? 
Uh, there's been a lot of kind of um, you know misleading issues with the data that have has made it difficult to track how this is going, but. To me, it just seems like there are more and more imbalances that are building up that are leaning towards the downside. And the things that have shown us that there is upside risk, to me, I know they're bucketed as upside risk, but really all they're saying is things are going to continue on as they have for a period of time, and, and that just doesn't usually tend to be the case. And, and some of that noise in the data certainly accounts uh, for some of the whiplash that we're seeing as investors try and react to every single data point. Yeah. Appreciate you joining us this morning. Thomas Simons, Jeffrey, senior U.S. economist. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. You might be surprised to know that healthcare stocks have been lagging the S&P 500 this year. That's despite being the source of one of the buzziest trends, the enthusiasm over weight loss drugs GLP-1s. Eli Lilly has been the big winner because of Manjaro, but elsewhere, it's been a mixed bag as drug makers normalize post-pandemic and grapple with government pricing pressures. More recently, investors have been scrutinizing headlines about health insurance M&A. Should you be positioned in healthcare stocks? And if so, where? We'll tell you in our new Yahoo Finance series, Goodbye or Goodbye. Three times a week, you'll get insights from investing pros on how to build your portfolio. Well, CEOs of the nation's largest banks have settled in for their annual oversight testimony before Congress. The message from the CEOs in unison, the Fed's proposed capital requirements will hurt lending 
and the economy. We believe the capital accumulated by the industry should continue to serve the customers in America's economy, not be subject to regulatory capture by a theoretical model. Similarly, JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon warned that the proposals could increase inflation by increasing the capital used for trading on hedging that could get passed on to consumers. If the cost of hedging these risks increases, everything from a can of soda to meat products will be impacted. Ironically, a proposal meant to mitigate risk will actually increase risk. And City CEO Jane Frazier warned that a recession is possible now given inflation and services, rising debt and a slowdown in global growth and conflict in Israel and Ukraine. She said she's beginning to see some concerning signs in the lower FICO score segment of our customers. She said raising capital now is a bad idea. Raising capital requirements by as much as 20 percent on an industry that all participants believe is well capitalized is a bad idea in any environment. But it becomes even more problematic with economic uncertainty ahead. Senate Banking Committee Senator Chair, uh, Chair Senator Sherrod Brown, though, saying banks do not want higher capital requirements because it will hurt profits. We are also getting some uh, developing news coming out of Washington, D.C., with former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy announcing that he will be resigning his post at the end of the year. Uh, Kevin McCarthy uh, putting out an op-ed in The Wall Street Journal um, talking about some of the accomplish accomplishments that he believes he made in his time there, saying that no matter the odds or personal cost, we, as in the Republican Party did the right thing. He says, it's in this spirit that I've decided to depart the House at the end of this year to serve America in new ways. I know my work is only getting started. We should point out uh, Kevin McCarthy coming on the back of what was a very, very contentious House speakership, the shortest in history, by the way. His term was set to expire in January of 2025. But again, this, uh, the former House speaker now announcing that he will step down at the end of the year. Well, gold has been on a wild ride this year with our next guest calling it an in-betweener asset. Signs of peaking interest rates sent the price of the commodity to a new all-time high. So how else can you invest in it going into 2024? As part of our ETF report brought to you by Invesco QQQ, let's bring in Vetify Financial Futurist Dave Nadig to discuss more. Dave, um, this is certainly a very timely conversation given the huge run-up that we have seen in gold. How do you play it in ETFs? Well, I think what's happened with gold is really interesting. I think the thing I'd point out is, well, yes, we've had gold be an in-betweener asset. You know, it's not quite doing as well as stocks, but it's doing better than bonds so far this year. If you look at what happened in November, we saw both the S&P 500 and gold go up in the same month. And generally, that doesn't happen, not with big moves. And I think last month it was uh, plus nine on the S&P and plus three on gold. That, to me, implies that we have a real buying frenzy for people who I would suggest are really apocalypse buying gold, if you look at the global geopolitical concerns people have, whether it's the Middle East, whether it's Europe, whether it's what we've been seeing now in South America, all of those kinds of geopolitical turmoil always drive folks to the yellow metal. They drive folks told, toward gold. And so we've seen a lot of activity in the gold bugs, if you will. Consider this sort of the cyber truck of assets. It's the one that you hold for the apocalypse. Uh, and what we've seen is folks pile into ETFs. Now, unfortunately, what we often see is people pile into the ticker that they know, which in this case would be GLD. It's a household name. But it's consistently underperformed two other cheaper versions of really the exact same experience. Exposure. I'd highlight GLDM, also from State Street, and BAR from Granite Shares. Both of them are a little bit cheaper, and year after year, they eke out that 20, 30, 50 basis point outperformance. So, Dave, when people are trying to follow some of these trends and trying to decipher, as you mentioned there, making some mistakes in terms of some of the tickers that they're following then, how do they determine when they're trying to vet some of these trends that they want to follow? Well, there are, there are lots of ways to get information on the ETF market. You can obviously come to the properties we run at Vetify. You can open up the newspaper. You can go to Yahoo Finance. There's lots of ways to get access to information about ETFs. The most important thing, though, is look under the hood and make sure you understand what you're buying. The ETF market has gotten big, and it's gotten complicated. There's thousands of ETFs right now. For any given idea you may have, there's probably a dozen ETFs tracking that segment. They're not all created the same. The other asset class we've been watching really closely, of course, bonds saw a huge run up this year, but we have seen a significant pullback in yields there. What do the inflows look like right now on your end? And how do people play this space? 
Well, the flows into ETFs this year have actually been pretty boring. And by what I mean, what I mean by that is it's been sort of a 60-40 allocation. About 40% of the assets have gone into fixed income, which is historically quite a lot. The interesting twist is a lot of that is chased active management in the bond space as well. There are a lot of very high-profile active bond managers out there, PIMCO, DoubleLine, just to name two. Fidelity's FBND, their total bond portfolio, has pulled in $4 billion this year so far. So people are really looking for different ways of playing the market. I know we talk a lot about T-bill and chill, but that's not what ETF investors are doing. They're looking for those pockets of value where they can figure out other ways to play the market. I'd highlight one other really interesting approach here that just launched, I think, last week, RSSB, which is return stacked stocks and bonds. And the idea there is it uses a very judicial amount of leverage so that you put a dollar in and you get a dollar of global equity exposure and a dollar of core treasury exposure. Kind of an interesting way to get a little bit more efficient with your capital. And in terms of separating the hype going into 2024, I mean, you have the Bitcoin spot ETF. What are some of the ones that you're watching that go beyond the hype that have really solid fundamentals that, that could be an opportunity here? Well, we had a great article this week uh, that just came in the Wall Street Journal looking at momentum trading. And we've definitely seen a lot of interest in momentum. Certainly, if you look at the, dispar the disparity this year between, say, the Magnificent Seven stocks and the S&P 500, say, the, the Qs versus the S&P 500, that gap is just enormous. And so lots of folks are trying to figure out the best way to play that momentum-y, growthy part of the market. I'd put a little caution on that, though, because while momentum investing does work, the big challenge there is how do you know when to get in and out of the market? Uh, you know, I, I, there are a few funds I'd highlight there. Alpha Architects, QMOM, QMOM, a great way to think about momentum into next year. It's got a team there really focused on knowing when to get into certain momentum asset classes and when to get Okay, our thanks to Vetify Financial futurist Dave Nadig there joining us from our studio. Coming up, Toll Brothers reported solid earnings and forecast booming housing demand for 2024. We're going to dive into their earnings call on the other side. We'll be right back.
Luxury home builders Toll Brothers trading up around 2.5% at the moment after reporting a mixed bag of results as rising mortgage rates slowed down buyer demand. The company posted weaker quarterly orders but set their guidance on deliveries for next year. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Danny Romero with more on the state of housing. Hey, Danny. Rochelle, forget about rising mortgage rates. Toll Brothers said in their fourth quarter earnings that demand was strong in October. Remember, mortgage rates were hovering around that 8%. They said on the call that they didn't have to increase incentives to drive up sales. And that really does point out and signal that the popular incentive for this home builder has been those mortgage rate buy downs. That's when you upfront the cost to lower down the rate on the loan. Another strategy that has been really successful for this home builder has been the spec home. That's when you don't necessarily have a buyer in mind. Those homes are selling $200,000 less than the build to order homes. And also another thing on the call that was said is that the spec home strategy has provided a return on equity for them compared to the build to order home. So they're seeing that as a gain. But let's talk about prices. That's all about homes. The prices are up over 12% from last year. However, Toll Brothers does expect uh, that their average closing price will be less than $1 million next year. That's part of their price mix strategy. Overall, what stood out to me for their next year guidance is that they plan to close a midpoint of 1,800 to 10,000 units next year, which is ahead of some of the analysts on Wall Street, their expectations of 1,800 to 9,000 homes. So far, they have signed over 2,000 net contracts with a price tag of less than $1 million. So that could be the direction of where they are headed going towards that affordable luxury housing. Danny Romero there uh, with the very latest on Toll Brothers. Thanks so much for that. Well, the United Nations Climate Summit COP28 is underway in the UAE with a record number of bank executives making the trip to Dubai. According to the UN's provisional list, at least 200 participants are coming from the biggest financial firms, including Citigroup and HSBC. The gathering comes as the International Energy Agency estimates a need for an annual $4 trillion in investments to make that transition to net zero by 2050. Let's bring in Michael Sonnenfeld. Uh, MUS Climate Partners Chairman and Partner to weigh in. Um, good to talk to you today, Michael. Uh, Four you. trillion dollars annually. That points to a massive opportunity that is out there. Where do you have your eye on in terms of the most uh, important investment that you think is necessary? Sure. So at Muse Climate Partners, we're a venture firm. We fund early stage companies that have scalable technologies. And the largest area is decarbonization, the shift from fossil fuels to alternatives, and whether it's new power plants that are renewable power plants, or the use of a conversion of electricity like electric vehicles, electric home heating, electric uh, industrial heating. It's the conversion uh, to electricity of pretty much everything. And fortunately, on a relative basis, in America, we're a little ahead of where China and India is. Uh, unfortunately, the three of us are still the largest emitters. But if you drive an electric car in the United States, it's more efficient because in China and India, it's being produced by coal-fired power plants. And that's really what we need to eliminate as quickly as possible. So, Michael, I mean, you have the conversations between politicians and then you have the corporations themselves. Are they as incentivized to, to spend in this space? Well, in the corporate area, it's largely voluntary uh, limits that they place because their customers demand it and so forth. Whereas in the government area, uh, they're talking about rules and regulations that come out of something like the uh, IRA. It's called the Inflation Reduction Act but it's the largest climate bill in history, which was passed about a year ago. But wherever it is, nobody's meeting their commitments sufficiently, neither in the corporate or the government sector. That's the real story of the conference going on uh, in the Middle East right now called COP28, because carbon dioxide emissions rose again last year. The rate at which it's rising is slowing, but we need to have it being going down, not rising slowly, if we're ever going to meet 
uh, the goals for a sustainable planet. Michael, how has a higher rate environment affected um, appetite within the space? I mean, it, sure. I realize as a venture capitalist, you're always taking on risk with new technology, but we're talking about technology and scale that will require enormous amounts of capital at a time when, their debt, when the debt costs a lot more. Totally. So you're making a great point. We live, venture capital is part of the private equity universe. It's the very earliest stages. So our companies are too small to qualify for debt, but as they grow, they need to build factories or build sales force or invest in the business. And that's where the higher interest rates have uh, put a headwind, slowed down the pace of expansion. But the good news is that in climate tech, particularly where we are, the climate is marching on. The world is getting hotter. So although Private equity generally really has been in some headwinds this last year. It's been a very tough year. Distributions are less. In the climate tech space, that's uh, uh, unfortunately an island of opportunity where we focus because we need to decarbonize the atmosphere if we want our children and grandchildren to have a livable planet. So, Michael, when you look at some of the most successful climate investments that you could point to that would encourage more corporations to, to, to step up their investments here, or even perhaps diversify as we have been watching the, the price of oil uh, continue to drop here, what, would, what, would that, what does that look like? What are some of the most successful projects here? Well, the projects that we like are the ones that just have an economic justification already. So when you're one of our companies, it's a small private company called Harvest Thermal, uh, makes the most efficient electric home heating system, and it can have huge economic savings, about 30% on your energy bill, and decarbonize as well, because it's converting from either gas or oil home uh, heating to uh, electric heating and air conditioning. So there are lots of examples, but today solar is just cheaper than fossil fuel plants head-to-head. Uh, -head. So Wherever you can have pure economics uh, drive, that's where the demand is going. Anything that's voluntary or just for environmental sometimes is harder, and that's where government incentives and policies come in. But fundamentally, uh, where you can have an economic justification and an environmental benefit, that's kind of one plus one equals three. Yeah, scale always key there, right? When you're trying to, to make the economics work, and that's certainly been the case with solar. Michael Sonnenfeld, Muse Climate Partners Chairman and Partner. Good to talk to you today. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Coming up, deals, deals, deals. We are talking recent M&A activity and the outlook for 2024. That discussion's coming up on the other side. We'll be right back.
Well, another merger and acquisition in focus this week with Alaska Air looking to acquire Hawaiian Airlines. The FTC has also been especially aggressively uh, this year on mergers, aggressively acting on mergers and acquisitions, despite the number of deals declining for the past two years, according to a report out by S&P Global Market Intelligence. To break down the numbers, Joe Mantone, S&P Global Market Intelligence editorial lead, joining us today. Um, Joe, good to talk to you. You know, this, this deal, potential deal that was announced earlier this week, really got us talking to say, is the activity going to start to pick up even more going into 2024, despite the thinking that when we're in a higher rate environment, M&A isn't necessarily the first place companies look? Sure. Yes. Well, first of all, thanks a lot for having me on here. And yes, we have been seeing uh, a few deals here and there, but the uh, the overall takeaway, I think, is just that M and A it's going. It's been slow, you know, from all of this year, and it was much slower in 2022 than it was in 2021. So it's going to take time uh, for, for the recovery uh, to, to really kick in. Um, the, yeah, as you mentioned, the h- higher rates. I mean, uh, the the higher rate environment. It certainly makes M and A uh, more challenging, but something that could help M and A in uh, 2024 is if you know rates are expected to stay higher for longer. But if they stop rising, if they stay at at, at, a, at an elevated rate without increasing, that can help uh, boost M and A activity. Just because buyers have a better idea on the uh, what their financing is, is going to to cost when it's when it's rising, you know, the, the financing, it gets more expensive. It can even get more expensive from the time that you announce the deal to the time that the deal is actually completed. And Joe, as we dig into the size of the deals versus the number of deals, then what does that mean in terms of expectations for 2024? And which sectors look perhaps the most ripe for more M&A activity? Sure, sure. Yeah, so I was recently looking at some of our data on uh, large M&A deals. I mean, the the large M&A deals have have been very muted uh, this year. I think we we've seen 14 10 billion dollar plus M&A deals uh, since the start of the second quarter and I was looking back at our data and it was in the second quarter of 2019 alone we saw uh, 14 uh, deals over 10 billion dollars and you know along with the, the higher interest rates uh, the, another uh, deterrent uh, for large deals especially in the US has been the antitrust uh, pushback from the from the the current administration not not all uh, uh, the deals that have been getting pushback ha- have actually been terminated. Some of them ha- have gone through. Uh, uh, especially the, the the biggest example is the is the Microsoft um, uh, Blizzard deal. Uh, but um, you know, but that deal did face a lot of challenges. So it's you know the, the pushback from the the regulators on M and A's has certainly elongated the process. And as the process gets gets longer, it, you know it adds cost and it, and it certainly brings um, it brings um, some some uh, some uh, pause. But before before companies want to per, pursue transactions, so it, it's definitely been, been a deterrent that the antitrust pushback. Yeah, Joe, I mean, those are two key headwinds that you just highlighted, the higher rates, but also this current environment over at the FTC. Lena Khan, very, very specific uh, in scrutinizing uh, a lot of these deals. What is the impetus then that would likely to spur additional M&A activity and what sectors do you have your eye on? Sure. Well, uh, definitely uh, on the sectors. The, the, always the easy answer on sectors is technology, just because there every 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 company you know needs added tech, and and oftentimes it's easier to buy a company uh, than than build in house. So so tech is definitely a, a space where where there, there, there should be uh, some some ramp up. Um, you know, and, and as far as as you know, companies. Sort of getting their arms around uh, the the antitrust. It's you know it's just a matter of, of something that else that you have to uh, factor in uh, to, to a transaction. You know uh, you know how how long it's going to take. You know so it it, it just comes down to, to the specific company and and the, uh, and the and the risk appetite. Something else in the U.S. that is also sort of uh, coming up in 2024, which may or may not ha- have a 
an impact on deal making is is a presidential uh, election. I mean, I, I've heard different t- takes on this, you know. Uh, but I think the general consensus is that 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 deal activity slows down a bit uh, around the presidential uh, election, just because uh, companies want to sort of uh, see, see see what happens and, and see what the, see if there's a change in, in the administration or anything like that. Um, also, I, I've heard that some companies you know don't don't want to uh, announce a, a, a big acquisition uh, it, during uh, the the campaign because that then maybe uh, their deal could become sort of fodder for a debate or something like like that so that that that, that can bring even even more scrutiny to a transaction so so that's something else that that, that we'll be looking out for uh, in the new year and and one of the ones that we're looking at Exxon and Pioneer working on on their deal here what do you think the the appetite is going to be for this and in terms of especially from a regulator's perspective Sure. Well, I'm certainly not a regulatory expert, and and uh, you know couldn't really uh, you know dive into to the details uh, uh, on the approval. From everyone I've spoke to about that deal, it's it certainly it, it's from an outsider's perspective. It, it seems like the general consensus is that 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 the deal sh- should get approval. Uh, but well, one thing interesting in that transaction was they um, they, they gave themselves a, a, a timeline of 18 months uh, to extend the close date. Uh, of the transaction, which which is which is pretty long. The 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 Hess Chevron deal uh, they only put a a twelve month extension in, in, into the merger agreement. So they the on the um, Exxon deal, the, the company is expected to get the close in the in the first half of next year. But the fact that they put in the in the merger documents that they could extend the close date out, you know, eighteen months. That that's just a sign, uh, in my opinion, uh, an acknowledgement of the end. Antitrust environment that we're in, that you know they expect the deal to get to get done, but it just may take a, a longer time. All of this points to what should be an interesting 2024 in the M&A space. Uh, thanks for joining us, Joe Mantone, S&P Global Market Intelligence Editorial Lead. Yes, thank you for having us. Well, the Las Vegas Sphere is turning things around. In a securities filing, Sphere Entertainment said it expects positive adjusted income for the venue this quarter, thanks to a successful run of shows. Shares are also getting a boost after Guggenheim upgraded the stock to buy from neutral, projecting profitability growth in the year ahead. So can the $2 billion venue keep up the positive momentum? Let's bring in Ali Canal for a breakdown there. Ali, I would love to go to a show there. Tickets are not cheap, though. No, not cheap. And really overall, though, the sphere seems to be paying off. Even though it's only been in operation for a little over two months, its YouTube residency has had a lot of success. Along with the Darren Aronofsky film, Postcards from Earth, combined, those events have brought in more than $75 million for the company so far. The bulk of that actually stemming from those film showings, which just shows the potential for this venue beyond your typical concert. In a securities filing, the company said it expects its sphere segment to report positive adjusted operating income for the current quarter. That will be aided by Formula One, which took over the sphere for the inaugural Las Vegas Grand Prix last month. And and if you think about the advertising potential there, there's been multiple brand campaigns with companies including YouTube's NFL Sunday Ticket, PlayStation, Meta, Xbox, Coca-Cola, all signing on for campaigns. So again, it's not just about live events. It's also about that immersive experience and really the potential to leverage that for different types of formats and experiences. It would be cool to see perhaps some e-gaming or stuff yes. going on in there as well. So I mean, especially when you look at the graphics. Now, Ali, we've also seen some successful runs with the shows at the Sphere this year. What's on the docket for 2024? Well, we know the NHL draft for 2024 will actually take place at this sphere. So again, illustrating the opportunity here for different types of live events. Beyonce is reportedly in talks for residency. That could be up to $10 million. We've also heard that Lady Gaga, Bon Jovi, they're all interested in residencies at this sphere. And I often think about how so many celebrities, so many musicians, they're attracted to Las Vegas and having their own residencies in Las Vegas. So what better venue to do that at the Sphere, especially considering the momentum seems to be there. People are excited about it. I even hear it amongst my own friends and family that they're interested in this experience. And we're at a moment in time where the live event space is just booming. People want to get out there.
there. That's where they're going to spend their money on. Like Akiko said, it's not cheap, but people are willing to spend the big bucks to see the performers that they want to see. Yeah, it's such a unique space, mm -hmm. right? I'd be curious how many other venues start to catch up to that technology, too. I could yes. argue some of it's already happening. Ali Canal, as always, thanks so much for that. Let's do a final check of the markets before we let you go. Going into the noon hour, we, all seeing, we are seeing all three major indices in the green right now. Trading pretty flat, though, across the board. The Dow up 15, the S&P 500 uh, right along the flat line, and the NASDAQ up about nine points. This coming on the back of those ADP jobs data that came came out earlier today, uh, pointing to weaker than expected numbers. Of course, the big number to watch will be later this week uh, with the non-farm payrolls coming out on Friday. That does it for Rochelle and I in this hour. Much more to come here on Yahoo Finance. Keep it right here.